Uh, good morning. This is a regularly scheduled meeting. Actually, it's an irregularly scheduled meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, this is uh, Wednesday, July 15th. We have a, a full agenda starting off with um, three work sessions and then amendment reviews. Um, I would like to first just thank everybody for being here, um, both people who are here in person that made the trip. And there are a number of us who are in the house chambers appropriately spaced, but also uh, kudos to Representative Griffin, who is in the state house, but just a little bit further away. Um, as everybody knows, this is this is unusual pattern, um, not quite as unusual as it was last week. We're getting our act together, I think, but we are setting new precedents here. I'd like um, just to go over our rules and then we'll just introduce ourselves again. We are following the, the <clears throat> rules of the Legislative Council, right? About masks, we are keeping our six foot distance. We are self screening ourselves before we come into the state house for any signs of other illnesses. Um, we are the committee members and um, staff are on <clears throat> Zoom and also um, this is being uh, broadcast on YouTube for posterity. Since the latter is the case, please be sure that you mute yourself when, uh, when you're not, uh, so you won't say inadvertent remarks. It'll be, uh, it'll be broadcast widely. Now we are going to talk about our first three um, bills and work sessions, and then we will put off the vote. We will then. Uh, at the end, when we've done those three, we will have our uh, clerk come in and um, uh, tally all votes at once, just in terms of logistical ease for those people who are not physically present. Um, we can remind you that you have to have um, your vote cast within uh, 24 next business day, 24 hours. You can do that through the presiding officer you can also do that through uh, Casey Milligan in the Legislative Information Officer in Information Offices. Um, with that, I would have people introduce ourselves. We'll start as usual on to my far right of the horseshoe, which is a Representative uh, Meyer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Michelle Meyer, serving Southern Maine's House District. Two, which is Elliott and parts of South Berwick and Kittery. Next. Hello, Wendy. Oh, yeah. Yes. Representative Stover. Are we going around the horseshoe or around yeah, here? We're, we're going the usual horseshoe pattern okay. at, um, uh, in our committee room, which is next is Representative Stover. Good morning, my name is Holly Stover. I represent House District 89, including the towns of Booth Bay, Booth Bay Harbor, South Port Edgecombe, West Port Island, and part of South Bristol. Thank you. Yes, Representative Kathy. Good morning, I'm Representative Kathy Javner. I represent House District 141, which is in Penobscot County in Washington County. Thank you. Hello, I'm Representative Ann Perry, uh, representing House District 140, which includes the towns of uh, Indian Township, Baileyville, Bering, Charlotte, Callis, Robinston, Perry, Pembroke, and Pleasant Point. Thank you. Yeah. Representative O'Connor. Yes, good morning. I am Representative Beth O'Connor representing House District 5, which is Berwick and part of North Berwick. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Senator Ned Claxton. I represent District 20, which is Auburn, Mine, and Mechanic Falls, Poland, and New Gloucester. I'm Jeff Gratwick, Senate District 9, representing Bangor and Herman. Representative Patty Hymanson, representing District 4, parts of York, Wells, Sanford, all of Algonquit, and I'm House Chair. 
Good morning, I'm Mary Ann Moore and I represent Senate District 6, which is all of Washington County, as well as Goldsboro, Winter Harbor and Sullivan and Hancock County as well. Good morning, I'm Representative Colleen Madigan. I represent House District 110, which is a part of Waterville and a part of Oakland. Good morning, I'm Margaret Craven and I represent House District 59, which is part of Lewiston. Good morning, my name is Abigail Griffin and I represent House District, District 102, which is Glenburn, and Levant and Kanduska. Thank you, and I would simply note that uh, Representative Talbot Ross uh, has something else pressing today, cannot be with us, although she's been talking with us on a regular basis before this. Uh, one additional note, you'll note that we are not talking about um, 1961 today. We have scheduled another meeting a week from today, Wednesday, uh, 722. It'll be at 10 o'clock in the morning when we'll be going through that in detail, a complex bill. So we would start off today with uh, the three, actually having said that, back out. Any other questions from um, the committee members? Thank you, seeing that. Then we start off with three work sessions. I'm gonna to turn to uh, Representative Hymanson to lead us first through the first LD803, an act to create four regional mental health receiving centers. And for our, I'm sorry, I also neglected to introduce our staff, which is Anna Broom, Aaron um, Dooling, and our clerk, uh, Allison Bernier. They're hiding someplace in the ether and we also are joined by others who have been given special invitation. There is, no op there is no opportunity at this particular time for people who have not been signed up ahead of time uh, to join this conversation. But for our clerks, if, you'd be, if you could uh, find Representative Warren and tell her that we're discussing her bill. Representative Hymanson. Uh, 803 is what we'll start with, and, um, and that is started out as an act to create four regional mental health uh, receiving centers, but we were offered an, an amendment which funds um, crisis, outpatient crisis services. And so we were hoping that we could speak with the department about what they're doing um, as a setup for both this bill and the next one, um, what it is um, that the department is working on for outpatient crisis services. So I see that um, Dr. Pollard is on the line, welcome. And um, if that's enough of an introduction and an ask for you, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about it, outpatient crisis services. Certainly, as long as you make set up it, it, in terms of teeing up as opposed to the negative connotation of set up, but we are, <laughs> are happy, happy to talk about. Absolutely, <laughs> I would say tee up. Okay, Tia, yeah, we're happy to, I'm happy to talk about, oh, getting a little feedback. Let me see if I can turn down my, hopefully that will help. Happy to talk about some updates from the last time we discussed crisis services and our plans for the state. Uh, and I thought it might be helpful to start with a little bit of level setting since we've had some updates in our, our office leadership since I last joined you. We now have two deputy directors who are part of the Office of Behavioral Health, one in charge of research and evaluation, as well as overseeing our technology related needs, and one in charge of strategic planning. And why I bring that up in addition to our new position regarding uh, opioid response, is that I think it's really important that we commit fully to improving the quality and integrity of the data that we have regarding behavioral health and that we make much better use of the data than has historically been the case for more informed policy decision-making and addressing service quality, uh, as well as our position, which will be focused heavily on strategic priority and spending in alignment with strategic priority. So I wanted you to have that update. And then um, just a level set for the group, we are 
continuing with our 24 seven availability of our statewide crisis line, mobile crisis services, as well as our intentional warm line for uh, peer support services. Those remain available 24 seven. And while I certainly wanna talk about the need to improve and expand crisis services for the state, I also wanna give some credit to our crisis service providers. We are one of the top performing states in the country for response to calls to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So for people who aren't aware of how that functions, it is a national line, soon to be a three digit number. But when calls come in, they're identified by area code and routed to the state from which they originate. And in our case, that's Aristic Mental Health Center and Crisis and Counseling Services, soon also to include the Opportunity Alliance. We answer 93% of our calls locally, which puts us in the top few percent of, of all state performance. So we think that that's a better approach and nationally that's seen as a better approach than having calls be handled by someone in a remote location who is not familiar with local resources. So certainly kudos to our, our local crisis providers for managing that. The, uh, and our current uh, data show that our mean response time to the statewide crisis line is two seconds. Uh, so I know we sometimes hear the anecdotes about waits for services. And when those do occur, those certainly present a challenge. And I think we should also credit our crisis line and our crisis providers for the speed of response on average to the crisis calls received in the state. In terms of what we're planning uh, upcoming and some updates on what we've done in the context of the pandemic for crisis services, we have been uh, meeting with the crisis service providers, the contracted crisis service providers and the non-contracted crisis service providers on a frequent basis. Uh, up until recently, that's been a weekly basis to make sure we have good coordination and adjust as necessary to the pandemic. We shifted $800,000 from our projected underspend in crisis service contracts from the fee for service portion of those contracts into the ancillary service portion. So what that means is the ancillary is a cost settled with invoice line in those contracts that allow the providers to bill for things that are not uh, traditionally reimbursable under a fee for service model. So we have both a fee for service and a cost settled portion of our crisis service contracts. And in recognition that the pandemic was actually significantly decreasing utilization of crisis services, as well as an acknowledgement that we needed to shift the portion of the ancillary even prior to the pandemic. We, in the last few months of the fiscal year, reinvested so that it wasn't an increase in spending, but the providers had much more flexibility to use their, crisis, their contract funds to cover costs such as PPE, hazard pay, uh, their work related to outreach to making sure people understood the beds were available, as well as the CSU staffing in addition to mobile crisis staffing, which is historically the only um, unreimbursable staffing time that had been included in those ancillary portions. That change uh, of adjustment to the ancillary, we had planned for 7-1 contract starts increases the ancillary portion of the contracts by 15%, so from 20% to 35%, allowing again that greater flexibility. And really importantly, it includes a portion, or includes an activity that wasn't previously there, which was is outreach, uh, as well as funding some um, unreimbursed CSU staff time when there's decreased utilization. We also put in an allowable activity of outreach, which will strengthen the referral network. So in other words, when staff are not busy responding to crisis calls or providing other reimbursable crisis services, we encourage them to spend that time outreaching to referral sources and connecting to the network of providers around them, as well as doing community outreach and education to make sure that people are aware of the crisis services and how to access them. 
because, you know, again, while I acknowledge that it would be, we do need to expand the availability of certain kinds of services, there's also an underutilization of existing services in some regions. So we wanna make sure that we make the best use of the resources that we do have available. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, we also um, asked and worked with the providers around uh, telehealth and, and shifts over to um, having the call-in visits and uh, worked with them around their PPE needs. We are continuing to fund NAMI to provide training and involvement for crisis intervention teams for law enforcement. And I think importantly, in, in conversation about the crisis service system, we don't solely want to focus on the point of crisis. We also want to focus on preventing crises. So we have, uh, in the context of the pandemic, increased the capacity of our intentional warm line so that the call volume of uh, increase by 40% has been managed by an increase in staffing. We've also made some improvements in this current fiscal year to our medication management crisis, uh, sorry, medication management contracts, uh, including those made by main care regarding more uh, telehealth flexibilities, which seems to have led to an actual increase in utilization, a slight one, but a, an increase in utilization, even as many services experienced a decrease in utilization. But we've also changed to allow a, or to uh, reduce administrative burden and are adding flexible funding to the contracts that allow uh, for things that are not currently reimbursable for med management and the supports functions that go along with providing comprehensive team-based med management. So that's been in process and developed collaboratively with providers over a series of, of meetings with our contracted med management providers. And we're also in the process of expanding our early intervention services for serious mental illness. We have uh, also been working with our colleagues in main care services to develop a service locator tool that has real-time uh, tracking capacity. So that's in process using federal grant dollars. We have uh, pr some plans in place to, re to improve the uh, 2 on one response and performance. So for example, tra training in psychological first aid to be more responsive to callers who are reaching out with behavioral health needs. We have changed our BRAP income requirement so that hopefully will lead to and, and seems to be leading to an improvement in access to housing, which of course uh, lack of access to housing can lead to crisis situations. And similarly have increased the number of uh, PNMI beds as well as funding for recovery residence beds or for a similar rationale. So we have, uh, those are uh, current changes as well as upcoming increases. I think in the context of the pandemic, it's really important to give you an update that we have applied for and received a funding mechanism from FEMA that's administered by SAMHSA that's known as a Crisis Counseling Program Grant or CCP. This is for disaster behavioral health response. We initially received a $1 million award for the first couple of months to get us up and started in the planning phase. And the subsequent phase, uh, we anticipate an additional $3.5 million as these are non-competitive grants that we are eligible for and have applied for the additional funding. To put in context, that brings us to $20.8 million in federal funding we have applied for since the start of the pandemic much of which we have received or anticipate receiving as their non-competitive grants for the state. So the, the, um, the crisis counseling program, we are calling our local implementation in Maine, Strengthen Me, Strengthen uh, then ME for the state. That supports a variety of measures that we hope will, or uh, have some evidence base to support will decrease the strain on the behavioral health system by providing more proactive interventions and as needed access to more uh, acute behavioral health resources. So what we've used those funds for so far is to increase the staffing for the intentional warm line as mentioned. We have supported 
the startup of the main frontline warm line, which is a support line for first responders and those who work in the healthcare field to get psychological first aid. We've supported or funded NAMI's teen text line. And I think importantly, we have hired or we're contracting with uh, predominantly ethnically based community organizations to hire community health outreach workers to engage individuals in a more proactive resilience building a model that's promoted by the, the CCP funding. So to help people access resources, build resilience, increase coping strategies, conduct needs assessment, and then link people to resources as appropriate. So we are in process of setting up a few contracts for community health outreach workers that will represent a significant uh, number of staff, around 40 community health outreach workers. That also includes funding for a public behavioral health campaign to outreach to the general public for awareness of what are anticipated behavioral health responses to a disaster and encourage resilience building, as well as awareness and education around what are signs that uh, people may be going beyond what's a typical uh, disaster response and into a situation where they need to be connected to uh, behavioral health supports or mental health services. So that's the Strength in Me campaign and program, and hopefully you'll be seeing uh, advertisements and videos and public service announcements coming out soon for the Strength in Me campaign. That campaign also includes uh, Healthy Life Resources in partnership with Acadia Hospital. So that will be employer-based resilience building, uh, particularly targeting those employment, uh, those who are employed in, in high-risk situations. So individuals working in healthcare, in retail, in nonprofits, for social services to uh, support the staff in those positions, as well as critical incident stress management debriefings. That uh, grant activity will also include statewide steering committee of psychological response to the pandemic under this umbrella of the Strength in Me program. And that seemed like a very long uh, uh, recitation. So I'll pause there to see if there are questions. And then certainly I'm happy to talk about other mental health and substance use uh, programmatic changes that we have planned. Thank you. It would be helpful if we had um, something that had bullet points on it that you could um, give us to outline um, all of the different parts that you were talking about. There were so many. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, think I will give you this nice bulleted list here. Great. That's great. So I'm going to look to the committee for questions. Yes, Representative Madigan. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. I have two questions. The first one is I'm wondering if all CSUs are open at this time. And then the next one um, is sort of related to the CSUs and crisis services. Um, I believe I heard you say that uh, you're were recommending or talking with providers about um, for when staff weren't involved in responding to a crisis call, having them do any things, do other things like outreach to community and things like that. And that sounds like a great idea. I just wonder if there's been any study on staffing on that. Having been a crisis worker, I can tell you that I know one of the measures is being able to respond within a half an hour. And if you're off in another part of the county, you know, given a presentation, you know, what, what's the staffing levels and how might that impact costs and all that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think right, the feedback is pretty terrible here. The, um, to answer your first question, the CSUs have not closed. We had one service closure that was unrelated to the pandemic that was due to staffing and inability to find and retain staff. Uh, but the CSUs themselves remained open. Um, the utilization was significantly decreased, however, unfortunately. Um, so the, the bed occupancy rates were down. And related to the second question, we worked with the crisis providers to really outreach to fill those beds. Um, 
I think there might have been an assumption that that the CSUs weren't open for business or and of course a lot of people uh, didn't actually reach out in the context of the public health measures for the pandemic in ways that um, I think were meant to kind of avoid emergency rooms or to avoid in-person contact in a way that actually led seemed to lead to decrease in utilization of the crisis line and other crisis services. So the CSUs, and, and with our assistance on this as well, at the beginning of the pandemic, reached out to the hospitals to say, we have these open beds as one example. And that allowed us to move uh, work with the crisis providers to move people out of inpatient beds who are ready for a step down level of care to free up the inpatient beds that were needed. So that would be one kind of outreach that could be really flexibly deployed. The kind that you're talking about in terms of more the scheduled community outreach, I agree would be a challenge um, to make sure that you have the staffing to respond to the calls. And those are measures that we that we do get from the crisis providers in terms of the response. and. And certainly um, the, the average is more than half of them are responded to face-to-face -face assessment in less than an hour from the point of the phone call, which for a state of our geographic size, I think is, is pretty impressive. I think if you wanna look at uh, any kind of silver lining to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been our provider's ability to rapidly shift to telehealth. And while I think that is not going to be uh, the way, the full way of the future for crisis services, broadly speaking, since that face-to-face -face assessment and interaction, I think is important for a lot of the crisis services. I think it has shown us that a lot of what we can do in terms of outreach and even presentations to community organizations can be done virtually. So along with our um, med management and other services, including ACT actually experiencing an increase in uh, utilization during the pandemic through the use of telehealth. I think we could be really flexible in the way we think about outreach being virtual as well, and certainly will need to be for the time being. Uh, but that remains a question about how the, how the staffing model will work for the, um, for the crisis workers and, and doing the outreach. But I think, you know, um, making sure that your your potential referral sources in the area know if you have availability and just those reminders that uh, that that could be an option. I know in my work as a provider for many years, even though you think you have great relationships with your referral network, every time you go and do that in-person outreach or that direct one-to-one -one outreach, lo and behold, there's a whole bunch of referrals that you know, where were they before you uh, made that phone call or did that visit to the facility? They certainly were there, but it's out of sight, out of mind, I think. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about the creative flexibility of the crisis providers and being able to use that time to increase the utilization. Yes, uh, Representative Craven. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am amazed at the amount of work that you've been able to do during this pandemic. It just seems unrealistic. Although I have spoken to one of my local providers that are very um, fond of the um, uh, telehealth and said that it was working very well. But my question is um, regarding the underutilization, where is that happening and why is there a, a, a are there people that aren't being served? Um, and, um, and, and why do you think that is? Well, I, if, if talking about purely in the context of the pandemic and, and um, thank you, I, I also find it uh, unbelievable how much we have done in the past few months. Um, it, it's, you know, to hypothesize, although I think it's hard to know for sure, our we were really expecting the calls to the crisis line to increase um, as people um, were not necessarily feeling as able to access the services as they typically would. That does not turn out to be the case. The volume of calls isn't up. And in fact, it, at times it's been down on average. And if we think about who makes the calls to the crisis line, it's not always the individuals themselves. It's, it's sometimes schools, it's sometimes other uh, providers who are needing that kind of acute assessment assistance. Uh, it's emergency rooms. 
And the public health measures have kept people from some of those in-person interactions that sometimes lead to those calls to the, to the crisis line and to utilization of mobile crisis. People had, you know, kind of hunkered down and emergency departments as well uh, in, in many places saw a decrease in those kinds of visits. So I think people stayed home. And, um, you know, I think the good news is that we did see people making use of some services, such as the intentional warm line that increased significantly. The, the National Suicide Prevention Line, it, it had peaks and valleys. On average, it wasn't statistically significantly up in volume. But I, I do think that some of the services we wouldn't have thought of traditionally as being telehealth ready or telehealth um, models really stepped up. Our recovery centers, our clubhouses, our uh, ACT teams, uh, we were really impressed uh, when we looked at the utilization data with main care to see how, and our MAT providers as well, our, our um, medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. So, you know, I think the provider community has done an outstanding job in making use of that. The utilization, I think, has varied by area, but if you mean kind of broadly speaking, we do tend to see the highest utilization or lowest um, unfilled beds, highest bed occupancy rates in the southern part of the state, so Cumberland and York counties. So those CSUs tend to be pretty full and in fact, sometimes average a little more than full. Um, whereas in other parts of the state, we can see it as low as, as 50 to 40% bed occupancy. So one of the things we've been talking about with the crisis providers, and I know a lot of them do this, but maybe there's a way to have a better system to manage it. Uh, clearly we wanna have people closest to home when they have uh, a crisis. But if it's a matter of not having a bed versus going to another region for a CSU bed, um, making that making sure that option is made best use of to fill empty beds and to make sure people who have the need are um, getting the need met. So in the long run, you know, shifting around the location of services may be necessary if utilization even after outreach efforts and even after uh, trying to make sure we expand capacity where needed. Um, it may be that we just have to, to shift the beds and where they're located in the state, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I'm looking at the Zoom links. I'm not seeing uh, any hand raised, uh, except for Senator Gratwick. Senator Gratwick. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pollard, thank you very much. Um, uh, I have to say a little overwhelming. I, I uh, got to 27 initiatives you had, and after that, I got confused. So the many things are going on, um, which is really truly remarkable, as you said. These relate more to the bill in front of us, 803, and this is, in essence, is a funding bill with nine different categories and numerous different subcategories. And my question is, and I suspect I know the answer, but I need you to articulate it for me. You're doing so well already with current funding. Do you need this other $4.4 million, which is allocated in very specific buckets, as it were? <clears throat> That's A. And then B, is the, the, the necessity for this money, because as you well know, there's going to be an enormous scramble on the appropriations committee. And is it best that we have it allocated in these specific areas or would it be best for you, um, you used the word flexibility earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Is it best just to give you the money? Dr. Pollard, here's some money. You're doing very well and we want to make you better. I mean, who's going to say no to that really? But um, it's, it's a, I have to say it's a challenging question to answer in some ways. And the reason why that's a challenging question to answer is because the, a few unknowns. I wonder if it's possible to mute a mic that's giving feedback, unless it's just for me, and then I'll try to record my voice echoing in my ears. Um, thank you. Oh, never mind. Not thank you. 
so the uh, thank you for that. The um, there is a, a current funding initiative that we don't yet know the status of, which is an increase of $35 million into the Federal Community Mental Health Block Grant Program, which includes a 5% set aside for crisis services. So that, uh, I, I'm not sure of the most recent status of that. It looked um, promising, um, but I don't, I don't know unless there's been a recent change, whether or not for sure we will see that increase to the community mental health block grants and our allotment from those um, and the specific earmark for crisis services. So that's a bit of an unknown. The other piece is, you know, historically our office has not, um, not been as diligent about the spending rate and some of the existing contracts, which means that we have not always fully spent the money appropriated to the mental health general fund. So we certainly have full commitment to and have made improvements and as we discussed around flexibility of funding to try to make sure that the money is used where needed. But it's it's a bit of a challenging question to, to know kind of um, if we were able to more proactively invest that money rather than not making full use of funds that were previously fully allocated to contracts that didn't allow us to kind of move them around, um, how much that would address what the current needs are. I'm not sure if that provided a, a clear response. Um, there are some areas that we currently have under grant funding, um, such as the public outreach campaign, which I think is important, um, that uh, we don't currently have a specific earmark for, for example, um, the kind of respite services that are part of or the kind of very short term peer supported um, uh, chairs and, and living room model that are part of the crisis uh, or receiving or diversion centers, whichever term you prefer, that's something we're certainly uh, interested in implementing as we've demonstrated with our RFP. But I think that's more for discussion a little bit uh, more so on the 1295 uh, discussion. I don't know if I answered your question though. Yes, I'm, I'm still just pondering this because um, the one thing I want to be sure is that we recognize the expertise in the department and allow you that flexibility. And I'm getting the basic response that if we allocate this money, you will be able to shift it around where it's going to do the, the, the best good. Because I, I'm not interested in funding um, programs that were fine yesterday, but the, the field has moved on and today it's not quite so good. Thank you. Uh, uh, questions, yes, uh, Representative Perry. I forgot what button to push. Uh, <laughs> It, it, listening to all of this and, and sort of looking at it as a broad picture, because we're talking right now about crisis services, services, and you had mentioned that there was money left behind in terms of the federal funding that has been available. And as you're new and able to step back and sort of look at the whole system, uh, are you finding that we have been spending money that actually cost us more and are not as effective as it could be. Uh, my concern is, is I would like us to make sure that we have services when needed without having to get to the point of crisis. Yeah. And uh, I know we have a lot of issues with how we're paying our providers. Uh, they're having troubles, you know, staying open and that kind of stuff. Have you been looking at sort of the whole system approach and how we can do a better job? Absolutely. And I, I think you either have heard or um, maybe not recently, I think it's been a while, but uh, Director Probert, I'm sure has talked about the comprehensive rate system evaluation. And we've worked with providers, particularly around the med management model to think about what are better reimbursement mechanisms for that intervention in particular. So those are all in development. I think it's important that we make 
full use of our federal match. So the rate development, I think it's really important that we do that in the context of CMS approval and sound methodology. But I do think that we've identified some gaps we're working on already. The mental health intensive outpatient, uh, there was a lack of a reimbursement mechanism there that was identified early on in my tenure. And I know other providers, I know providers had been identifying that as well prior to my joining the team. And so that's just kicked off as of uh, last week. We had our initial meeting with the uh, Burns and Associate rate team and providers are engaged in how to, how, to, how to develop that rate. What are the assumptions that need to go into that? Uh, the medication management, I think, is a big piece, and we're certainly working on the longer-term plan, and in the short term, we've developed some support contracts for the med management providers, because I do think, exactly as you said, people need to have access to those services uh, to avoid crisis. So just like you know, the, the peer support services and how those have been useful in the context of the pandemic and our recovery centers... And uh, a lot of um, a lot of efforts going through virtual resources. We need that to be a more um, permanent. Um, so I, I think I think this has been a valuable learning tool. Uh, if you have to get something positive out of a pandemic, in that some of the services that we didn't think really could necessarily be delivered effectively via telehealth, we're seeing have have been uh, well utilized. So, I mean, to answer your question about investment, you know, we spend a lot on transportation and it's, and it's not enough. We're a rural state. We don't have some areas where there's access to transportation and for people to have to access childcare in order to get to a, a treatment appointment. Our ability to move more toward telehealth, I think, doesn't necessarily represent for us an increase in spending, but there's certainly an increase in savings. Um, I think that we have, there's national data and, and it looks, you know, no different in Maine that if people end up in an emergency department, they are more likely to be hospitalized than if they get specific appropriate uh, crisis behavioral health services that have a much better need to fit when you look at uh, the assessment of what the individual needs and then what they're connected to that's much more effective if you have a comprehensive crisis system of care rather than kind of the um, very high numbers of people who end up hospitalized when they go to an emergency department setting. So I do think there's continued work to be done, but I, I am encouraged that we may be able to make better use of resources via telehealth options than we thought possible before because it's it is a challenge to think about how are we going to get treatment services to rural settings when we have workforce challenges, uh, workforce challenges nationally, let alone in rural parts of Maine. Um, so I, I'm encouraged by by the possibilities that this is presenting, but we certainly do need we, uh, and as I think we've acknowledged by engaging in the the rate study, need to look at our rates and adjust some reimbursement mechanisms. And I think. Hopefully, providers have have felt encouraged by some of the recent changes um, for some of the uh, per member per month rate development, as well as the MHIOP component being filled in, and then what we're working toward with med management and increasing ancillaries for our crisis services, which allow that uh, flexible use of funding. Thank you. I'm I'm going to. Um... Uh, just set you up for my questions, and then I'm going to ask the, um, Representative Warren to um, speak because she uh, has to go back to her committee. But Dr. Powell, if you wouldn't mind staying so we could continue this conversation with you. Sure. Is, um, but I would like to ask you about, um, you touched on some social determinants of health. I'd also like to know about telehealth and how you see it um, continuing after the pandemic, because I'm hearing that uh, the payers want to break it apart now that it's been so successful. There's some pressure to somehow take it away. So I wanted to figure that out. And, um, and also talk about uh, mental health police liaisons who are co-located in law enforcement agencies. So that whole idea of co-locating 
mental health crisis services with police so that they don't have to do the work of crisis management and, it, and taking that off their plate. So if you could um, hold on and we'll talk about those topics for a minute. Meanwhile, um, uh, Representative Warren, I think you have the ability to unmute yourself. If you don't, I will. I do, and thank you all. Thank you for the um, opportunity to be here. Sorry, I'm just running in. We also are, as you know, meeting uh, downstairs. So um, I just want to um, just remind you all of the public hearing and the information that you received on this bill, LD803. Um, it's, it isn't posted on the website, the amendment. I hope that you all have it in the packets that this bill is uh, a proposal to fund the crisis lines, the mobile crisis units, and the crisis stabilization units. As you look at what's happening across our country and many states are taking a look at what's going on with their police forces, one of the pieces that's an evidence-based practice, one of the pieces that folks keep talking about uh, is the mobile response. This idea that when folks are in a mobile crisis, and the police are called, excuse me, when folks are in a mental health crisis and the police are called, there's a place for those police to then call and get a mental health specialist to come. That's part of what this bill does. I apologize that I can't speak to how the fiscal note is going to change or has changed or how the grants have changed or will change. What I can ask you to do is to support this policy and send it on to the Appropriations Committee because this policy is about a lot more than just crisis services. It's about the crisis services that interact with the police departments in the state of Maine. If you go back and look at the reports that have happened in our state, looking at use of deadly force, looking at um, you know, lots of reports that we are hearing about nationally in other states, but that are also happening here in our state. Those issues are unequivocally 100% related to either a mental health crisis or substance use disorder. It's where someone's maybe using alcohol to the extreme and is now uh, either uh, injured by a police officer. You've all heard these cases. This bill, LD 803, is the beginning of trying to take some of the roles that we have put on police of being the first responders to mental health crises and to substance use disorder crises. That's what this bill aims to do. And I, I just ask that you'll support it and send it on to the Appropriations Committee. They'll be able to move the money around to, to fund uh, you know, what they want and don't want. But I ask that you support the policy idea. And, uh, and, and again, the policy idea is evidence-based. That's why it was recommended by the Mental Health Working Group. This is a bill uh, endorsed fully by the Mental Health Working Group. And it's also something that is being discussed in many states. As if you look up what's the best way to reform police, you will see these sorts of recommendations coming out of those reports. So I, I, I apologize. It's definitely something I'm passionate about. Um, and, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Anyone have questions for Representative Warren? Seeing none, thank you for attending. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Um, so uh, if we could go back to Dr. Pollard and, and really um, dive into that idea of, you know, I remember on this public hearing, hearing from police that they didn't want to be mental health workers. You know, they wanted the support. And so we're looking to, with this funding, so if you could talk about that, um, how, there are mental health police liaisons who are helping the police in these crisis situations. Well, um, 
I, I uh, do want to acknowledge that we did put in a supplemental budget initiative for law enforcement co-responders. Um, unfortunately, it was not included in the supplemental budget, but I, I think that does speak to our agreement that law enforcement co-responders um, would be helpful. Uh, we do have mobile crisis services now that are in some areas engaging in uh, law enforcement co-response. And the crisis line has, an, sorry, I'm just distracted by the feedback, um, has a uh, fast track for police. So the, thank you. So the uh, law enforcement who call into the statewide crisis line have uh, the Opportunity Alliance has who who uh, administers our statewide crisis line has a, a standard operating procedure to fast track law enforcement calls to respond uh, with police. It's um, I think it's something we need more of. I agree that's a really important and evidence based practice. And as we met with our colleagues in the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Corrections. Uh, more regularly prior to the pandemic, uh, but we have another meeting coming up soon to resume our, our work together um, or our focused work on this this particular issue, I should say. That it, that is a need that that continued to be identified, law enforcement co-responders. Uh, so that's why we did request uh, that in the supplemental budget. Um, not that I'm bitter, but um, we do continue to look for ways to to um, support that kind of service. We have some federal grant dollars that are specifically earmarked toward um, responding with uh, law enforcement and partnering with law enforcement around opioid response, which is helpful and, and we'll be able to implement those programs um, at least as long as the grant funding lasts. However, more on the mental health side would certainly be appropriate. Our mobile crisis providers, um, it, it varies by region. I think how much the police are aware of that resource and how strong those partnerships are is, is what I understand uh, in my conversations with the crisis providers. Um, so while in, in theory that infrastructure exists, I think it needs to be improved upon. So, you know, it, it is something we could see increasing with the ability of the mobile crisis services to be uh, reimbursed for their outreach work. So perhaps that time could be used and spent uh, engaging with their law enforcement community in their regions. And certainly there's no reason why that, that couldn't include uh, working with law enforcement on ride-alongs or uh, spending more time responding to calls in collaboration with law enforcement. Um, but I do think having those those, that's not the same as the co-location, which I think a lot of people have identified and certainly there's some evidence base to support, would be a useful addition to a complete crisis continuum. And I didn't explicitly say this in my kind of lengthy opening remarks, but I think that it's important that we aren't looking at a one-stop shop kind of solution or one size fits all solution, that we really think about a complete continuum of crisis services um, that is certainly the model that's pushed, uh, rightly so, by SAMHSA, by the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, um, by experts in suicide prevention, by law enforcement communities, and certainly we've seen in other states who've adopted those models that they've seen significant uh, savings on their law enforcement side, as well as hospitalization costs. So, uh, so law enforcement co-response, I think, was was one of your questions, and, and I do agree that that would be a useful addition to our continuum that we don't yet have sufficient capacity for, um, although I am, I think there's some reason for optimism. We can improve the linkages between our existing mobile crisis system and their law enforcement communities around them. Uh, as far as telehealth and permanent changes, there is a... Um, it depends on the funder, I suppose, to your question. Main care. Yeah, I, th I think if you just say yes or no, that there are problems that you're attending or no, you're not, or, or there are problems. I just want to make sure that these, 
efforts are continuing for telehealth um, because I've heard that there are some stress on continuing the telehealth systems. Uh, so we don't have to make many changes on the main care side in order to continue the telehealth. Our telehealth policies were already quite liberal and the few changes we had to make were very much interested in continuing. There are things at the federal level uh, that are outside of our control that there are strong push and advocacy efforts to continue um, that would allow the broader telehealth flexibilities beyond what we have in Maine already. So I'm taking from that answer that you're not worried about that. Um, I, I think we have an incredibly flexible telehealth policy in Maine. I would worry about um, the f uh, sources outside of Maine care and continued flexibility there. Uh, that is outside of our control. And, and certainly um, Medicare is one component that we would like to see those changes become permanent and have not been given a guarantee yet that that will happen um, because of course dual eligibility will affect the medicare coverage of the main care clients with dual eligibility for telehealth services you also asked about social determinants for health but i'm happy to pause if they're um rather follow up on those points yeah just a, a brief we're, we're running a little bit out of time um to continue this um uh, so if you could be brief about um just you mentioned a lot of social determinants of health and I simply want to know, to, to know that you're working on those in, as part of your crisis management. Yes, we uh, briefly, we have increased the uh, staffing dedication to our housing programs and reconfigured some of our structure to uh, a housing and recovery team that will be more focused on uh, or allow greater focus on housing, employment, and uh, peer and other kinds, recovery coaching and other kinds of supports. Thank you. Um, so I think any other questions for Dr. Pollard? Um, seeing none, thank you very much for being here. Um, if you could write out a bullet pointed topic um, uh, document for us, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much for being here. I'm gonna to turn to Erin now, who will walk us through the, um, the, uh, um, the amendment. Sure, good morning. Uh, my name is Erin Dooling. I am a legislative analyst with the Office of Policy and Legal An Analysis. Our office provides nonpartisan information and we do not take positions on or advocate for any legislation. Um, if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to share my screen so you, I can walk you through the amendment. Is that okay with you, Representative Hymanson? Okay, there you are. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't see where you were. Yeah, I don't like to turn my microphone on too much because it, it produces feedback. So I'm going to just put my thumb up when you ask me something, and I'll. Yeah. Okay, I'll make sure I try to find your video. Um. Okay. I don't know why it's not coming. Sorry, please bear with me while I get that on the screen. It was up for a little bit, Erin. I know, I don't know where, that's that's not the right one. Oh, <laughs> oops. All right. Sorry, it's just gonna take me a moment. Okay, let's try this again. Can you see that? On the screen, can you see the bill analysis? Yes. Okay. Um, the sponsor did draft an amendment um, just for ease of having everything in one place. And I find the bullet points um, a little simpler to follow um, because there's a lot of moving parts for funding and activities in this amendment. I'm gonna refer to the bill analysis that I provided to the committee at the work session. 
Um, so the sponsor's proposed amendment uh, proposes to appropriate about $45,000 to, to, in order to staff two statewide crisis lines um, and the statewide intentional warm line um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, in order to provide effective efficient services in the least restrictive manner. It also directs the department to work with law enforcement officers to ensure that the two lines are effective resources and it directs the department to work with the Department of Labor to access grant funding and provide training on workforce development for the mental health peer support specialists who are providing services on those um, two crisis lines. Um, one of the questions I have is um, the, the, the direction to the department to work with the various agencies um, is included in the blippy um, and it's unclear to me whether the funding for that, uh, the $45,000 um, is intended to also include the directions to work with Department of Labor and law enforcement officers, or whether it's just for staffing for the crisis line and the intentional warm line. Do you want me to keep going or do you wanna, um, represent Hymanson, I lost you. <laughs> Does anyone have questions up to this point? Um, seeing none. Okay. Um, section two of the sponsor's proposed amendment um, appropriates um, a series of general fund dollars um, to provide certain services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's approximately $808,000 for mobile outreach peer workers, $406,000 for certified intentional peer support specialists and recovery coaches. $554,000 for mental health police liaisons that are co-located in law enforcement agencies, $113,000 for community debriefing and critical incident response, $470,000 for mental health police liaisons co-located uh, in law enforcement agencies and mental health professionals with crisis service expertise and 911 dispatch. $636,000 for ancillary services that are required components, um, such as uh, of providing those services, such as travel costs, travel time, and telephone conferences. Um, so that's the list of appropriations. It, um, the piece about the mental health police re liaisons, um, I'm unclear how the $470,000 appropriation fits in with the $554,000 appropriation and whether they're two separate things because um, they're worded kind of similarly or, or whether um, they're supposed to be something different. I would and say they're two different things. One is a 911 dispatch center and the other is co-locating in the law enforcement agencies. Okay, then some, some of that language would need to come out um, because it looks like they're both for co-location at the moment as currently proposed. Um, the, blip, the blippy also directs the department to include um, the mechanism of cost settlement in its contracts with mental health crisis intervention mobile response services. Uh, if that's a directive to the department, it, 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 I don't think that should be in an appropriation section. That should be either in resolved language or statutory language um, to the department to, to um, have that uh, operational. In addition, um, it directs the department beginning in October to provide reimbursement for peer support services, um, providing the mental health interventional mobile response services. Um, if this is a new and ongoing uh, reimbursement coverage requirement, um, that should be directed in statute. Um, and then with the unallocated language directing the department to develop the rate, which is how we've handled um, new reimbursements uh, lately. Uh, if there are no questions, I'll go on to section three. Uh, this also has an appropriation of approximately- Can I just stop you for a minute? Can yeah. you go back to, uh, let's review the word mechanism of cost settlement, that paragraph. Can you explain that intention? I don't know the intention. Um, I, this, perhaps the sponsor could speak about that, but I, and maybe the department could explain what cost that means. What does, do you know what that means? Is that what you're, uh, including contracts with mental health crisis intervention services, the mechanism of cost settlement? What does that mean? That is not my expertise, oh, okay. unfortunately. 
okay. um, but from it, I, I can't, I don't know if I can the substance of it, I can just point out from a drafting perspective, I think it's easy waste. Okay. Is there somebody? Oh, great. Um, Dr. Pollard, can you enlighten us? Yeah, so we have a <clears throat> different types of cost settlement. So it's not clear from this if, if it's meant to be broad by saying mechanism of cost settlement. When I've used the term uh, prior, it, when I was describing ancillary, that's a type of cost settlement, um, cost settlement with invoice. So there's a sort of more traditional cost settlement. Basically, the provider submits a budget to us and uh, states their revenue and expenses. And cost settlement means we simply pay the gap between revenue and expenses. Uh, the department generally has moved away from a, a broad cost settlement methodology, which is uh, giving the provider one twelfth payments over the course of a year for what their expected budget needs are, and then uh, quarterly settling that up to make sure it accurately reflects true expenses and reimbursement. It's kind of, it's a, it's a bit of a, a cumbersome model. We've moved uh, toward more per member per month models that take into account more service delivery cost um, than the traditional fee for service models. We also have the hybrid model that I mentioned uh, a few times, the ancillary which is cost settled with invoice. So it, it's not explicitly that we will pay the, the basically the losses of the provider outright or pay 100% of their losses, but we say this, these are the allowable expenses and activities that we will pay for. Um, and you can uh, bill us for those expenses uh, only, not that we'll pay 100% of losses. Um, so it's a, it's a particular reimbursement mechanism that simply has a provider budget submitted to us and we pay the difference between revenue and expense. Uh, that's the cost settlement method. Um, and unfortunately it, it can be um, sometimes pretty extreme in terms of what is, um, what service is delivered uh, versus what is, what the cost of the service can be. But that, but that's going beyond the answering the question, just the question itself. So that, that is the cost settlement method. Senator Gratwick. Yes, thank you. Just to clarify, is this a document, Dr. Pollard, that you and the department came up with, or is this something that uh, Representative Warren did on her own with a with another group, or is it does it come from the advocates? Senator, what you're looking at is my bill analysis that I prepared as a summary of um, the sponsor's amendment. And that information is on the community uh, materials. Yeah. Understood. But the the question of the of the specific dollar amounts and the categories is this does this come from the department? No, uh, we had uh, after the last work session for this LD uh, had hoped to get together with Senator Warren and some providers and advocates to uh, go through this in more detail, but that uh, unfortunately did not in the context of the pandemic. But the, um, unfortunately, we did not develop this amendment or the amounts, and I'm not, I can't, I cannot um, sort of explain the methodology behind these amounts. Um, Senator, the sponsor provided um, a series of financial spreadsheets that I'm going to scroll down to that were um, submitted to the committee um, during the work session, but unfortunately, I'm not sure. Um, it might be easier for you to pull up those documents on your own so you can resize them. I'm not sure how to have it neatly displayed um, with a screen share in this in this manner, but um, it, I'm kind of showing the document. Um, the budget document that the sponsor submitted. And then she also had an email about the budget of county jails, which is all attached um, and is on the web, the website. All right, can you continue then after? So we, we finished section two. Yeah, I'm happy to move on. Um, uh, okay, let me just, um, questions. So uh, Representative Perry. Yeah, I, I just had uh, one question about uh, the cost resettlement 
I don't know that happens all over the place, but with a change and looking at changes to the per member per month, I think this is for Dr. Pallad, does that take, or Pollard, I'm sorry, uh, does that take away or decrease the need to have those kinds of settlements uh, and gives um, the agencies the ability to spend for each situation as needed? I'm sorry, is the question comparing, uh, does a per member per month uh, negate the need for a cost settlement methodology? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it, it depends on the service itself. I think the crisis services are tricky because they are 24-7 um, availability and it's, challenging to know how much they'll be utilized at any given time. So a per member per month for crisis services wouldn't, um, would not be a, a method that would make a lot of sense just in my kind of immediate reaction to that. What we've tried to do is strike a balance there by allowing a cost settled with invoice. So only for a certain allowable activities rather than just say, anything can kind of be in the budget. Um, but, but the per member per month is really, I think more for ongoing services, out, regular outpatient services. The, some of the crisis services already have sort of a, a per day rate, which is kind of similar, um, but it's really more about the utilization unpredictability. So a, a per member per month or, or other kinds of um, per member uh, reimbursement methods would still present some challenges in terms of uh, fluctuating utilization of the service. So I think the, the balance between some kind of fee for service and uh, a more restricted cost settlement method is where we've landed so far, but we're certainly exploring options with uh, CMS on other potential ways of addressing the underutilization costs. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, if we can have um, Mallory uh, Shaughnessy uh, invited to the conversation. I just got a text from her, but I think she should be on the Zoom to say those things. Um, okay, um, that, that'll take a few minutes to take. Okay, um, all right. Um, so the next one is about um, uh, for for uh, Dr. Pollard, um, mobile services under main care. This is a request to provide reimbursement for peer support services as mental health intervention, mobile service response services under main care. Um, can you tell us about the coverage for main care for this work? For peer is, services. Is there a rate that we have developed? No, there was, uh, there was some beginning uh, there was some beginning work around exploration of a rate. The challenging piece uh, for the peer services and uh, CMS reimbursement of a peer rate is um, <clears throat> there are some tricky components given the peer service delivery or the peer model that we have in the state, intentional peer support. There's some conflicts of the the kind of professional ethics of that model, for example, not conducting assessment and not uh, documenting that are in conflict with the um, CMS kind of rate development requirements. So in other services, we have bundled rates, which include peer services, rather than have peer services as a distinct uh, separate rate. So for example, the behavioral health homes have peers, um, as part of the overall bundled rate, um, but developing a separate peer rate is challenging for that reason because of the kind of requirements that we have to reimburse directly for those kinds of services being a bit in conflict with that particular model. So what I'm hearing is that this direction is a challenge for reasons um, that go above and that, the, that this is a, 
a good service to have ma main care cover, but it's a challenge to actually get there? Yeah, certainly we want federal match when possible. And uh, that of course means CMS approval. And there's some logistic challenges uh, with what peer services do versus what you're allowed to um, develop, what you need to do in order to justify a rate. Okay, so us saying as a policy to direct you to provide reimbursement for peer support services under main care is something that is complex and more challenging than just directing you to do that, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we have Mal uh, Mallory Shaughnessy on the line. She wanted to talk to us about the cost settlement language because she says it's really important. Um, so I'm gonna, I've asked her in, if you could unmute yourself, Mallory, that would be great and introduce Hi. yourself. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, yes, it, it is a real concern to crisis. Could you introduce yourself? Would oh, you introduce sure. yourself? Um, yeah, Mallory Shaughnessy, Executive Director of the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services, the statewide community-based safety net providers, uh, mostly main care and uninsured um, for behavioral health services, mental health and substance use. Um, and many of them are crisis providers or many of the crisis providers are members of ours. Um, and we have had these discussions when the contracts shifted from the, the cost settlement to the fee for service, there was a, um, unfortunately a real sort of ratcheting down of capacity in that it, you know, the, 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 um, kind of comparison is saying to a fire department, um, we're going to pay you per fire, but you need to be open 24 seven and ready and available. And, and that's sort of what we ran into with crisis services in that there is that fluctuating as, as uh, Director Pollard was saying, there is this fluctuation of utilization, but you can never overfill yourself to make up for the dollars you lose when you are underfilled. So there is no sort of um, um, equalizing factor. And yes, there is some additional cost settlement <clears throat> for, for certain limited pieces, but once you start ratcheting down it's just a ratcheting down process. Um, and like I say, you can't overfill your CSUs and overfill your, your crisis response. At times you have a limited capacity, but then you have underutilization and you can never make those dollars up. Um, and so if you wanna keep a robust system and have a really robust response of highly qualified, highly trained individuals that can really do that mobile crisis response um, and not have a constant turnover, um, et cetera. They've gotta be paid well and they've gotta be there and available. And there are always ways, and in the past, what crisis would often do, um, they weren't necessarily reimbursable items, but because of the cost settlement, they did a lot of ride-alongs. They had a lot of interaction with police departments. They did a lot of outreach just if they weren't in response mode, um, because there was some underutilization of that, they were out in the community doing outreach and doing response and, and following up with folks that they had had inter interactions with before in a very sort of preemptive preventative way. So to, you know, at one point Maine was really looked at as one of the preeminent crisis response systems in the country. And unfortunately, if you were to um, look at the response in the system we have now and talk to folks in the comparison, we just don't have the same system we did have. So this cost settlement really is a big issue to maintain that 24 seven um, response, robust um, trained capacity. Representative Madigan. Thank you, I have a question. Um, I guess both for uh, Mallory and uh, and then anyone else in the department that wants to answer it. Um, when you're talking about the cost settlement way to pay for it versus fee for service, I have a real concern. Um, I want us to use tax dollars wisely, absolutely. But um, I also think lots of times when we talk about um, changing the way we pay for services, we forget that um, that trickles down and that inevitably affects the people who provide the direct service mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and if you pay them just fee for service and you're paying them, th that means they get less money 
which means they won't work those jobs, which means that you get high turnover and inevitably it affects quality. Um, so sometimes I get really frustrated when I hear people who have, I, I don't care, who have jobs, who have benefits, um, making decisions that directly lead to people who provide direct clinical services, losing benefits, having less stable employment. And that absolutely affects the quality of services that consumers get. So I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that because I'm always very leery about fee-for-service uh, models. And I really thought we were moving away from that. So I, I think I have not done a sufficient job in explaining that we're doing both fee-for-service and cost settlement in the crisis contracts. So when it, the term maybe is confusing when I've been saying ancillary, that is a cost settled with invoice mechanism. So in an attempt to strike a balance between making sure we maximize the reimbursable portions and, and frankly, the, the sort of motivation to do that, that we also recognize exactly as is said that there are times that the re, that utilization is outside of anyone's control and that the examples Mallory gave about making use of that time is exactly what I was attempting to describe before with the more flexible ancillary table and shift to greater portions of the total contract amounts into an ancillary line. So those are cost settled with invoice mechanisms within the contract. So I mean, I push back a bit on the the um, firefighter analogy simply because firefighters don't get Medicaid reimbursement. Um, for, they don't get paid when they respond to fires, but. But absolutely right that 24 seven availability is needed and expected. And that's why we attempted to strike that balance of saying we do expect providers to seek reimbursement as much as possible, but we've also put funding in to allow for the unreimbursable time to be covered when it could be put to good use. So we certainly don't wanna just pay for downtime for the sake of downtime. We wrote in pretty broad and flexible language into the current contracts about how providers could spend that time and seek reimbursement from us under the cost settled mechanism. I, okay. I think that if I could, there, there are definitely some improvements with that ancillary uh, piece. Um, without that, that we were really in trouble. Um, I think that has helped, but I do think to, to uh, Representative Madigan's point too, the investment that we make in crisis services and the rates that we pay don't really allow for good uh, full benefit package and good pay and highly qualified and retention of those folks. We get a lot of turnover, folks that are coming out and you know getting their feet wet, um, getting some service uh, training and then moving on to better paying jobs. And we do see a lot of that turnover and that is not a stable <laughs> crisis system. Um, and between the shift to fee for service, this addition is group is good. It's a it's a great step, but we I don't think it's fully meeting the problems within the system of having that stable, constant capacity to respond well. I, I just that I'm just sharing that from the field. Just to process, if you could raise your hand and and I'll call on you to to respond. Um, Sorry. That's okay. It's such an unusual format. It feels different in a lot of different directions. Um, so uh, are there questions about that part? I, I myself am seeing that maybe that part about the cost, cost settlement needs its own public hearing and its own separate bill. I don't feel ready to talk about that and that the, um, the uh, main care rate is a challenge to create. So just Keep that in your mind as we go forward. What is it we can actually do this with this bill and what really needs to be explored more than we have uh, now the, the chance. So um, if we could go on to section three. Uh, how about, do you want, does anyone want to take a break for 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Can we do that first? Um, I'm not sure how to take a break with this. If we just kind of shut our mics off in our video. Um, I think that's what we do. I don't think we close anything out. So I'm going to say, why don't we come back um, at about 20 to 1. I think that's right. Representative Hymanson, you just need to make sure your videos and audio are on.
to blink will continue to stream.
Uh, this is a continuation. It's um, uh, 1250, continuation of the, of the HHS session on um, 715. Sorry this has taken so long, uh, but we, we uh, discussed this briefly on our lunch break, and um, I would elicit a motion to table um, 803. Do I hear? Yes. Senator Claxton seconded. Anybody? Is Senator Claxton? Yes. So, Representative Hymanson, for the no discussion, all in favor of tabling this? President, and I see people online. Representative O'Connor. Does it? It, it? it is the majority of the people in the room. So this is tabled. And we will, the next item is um, LD 1295. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to do that? Um, okay. okay. So LD 1295, and have we been joined by our mm -hmm. analysts? Yes. So, excuse me, um, an act to determine the need to increase the number of forensic emergency and crisis beds. Um, and this has several amendments before us. I think I would, this is a work session and I'd first turn to our analyst. Is this you, Erin, or is this uh, Anna? You're stuck with me still. <clears throat> Such is life. Life could be much worse, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> it's our pleasure. So if you want to go through this, Erin, that'd be great. Um, sure, you want me to go through my bill analysis from uh, the last time we met on this? I have, with apologies, I have great difficulty understanding some of the diction here. Um, sure, uh, hold on, I'll pull up my bill analysis. Um, just one second. Please do, yes. Wasn't your bill analysis though on the, uh, the previous or the original bill? Not the I summarized the amendment on it. Oh, did you? Okay. Did you email that to us? Uh, yes. Both the um, bill of points that you received from the sponsor on her amendment and also the summary on my bill analysis. We'll find it. Thank you. So I assume you want me to start with the summary. Um, sorry, if someone could mute their mic, there's a lot of people. Um, you want me to start with the proposed amendment um, from the sponsor? Please. Okay. Yeah. Can you see that on the screen now? Okay, I'm going to assume you can. Yeah, can I, can I ask something? So I, as I understand it, um, the, the amendment that the sponsor is proposing is a different amendment. It's this one, an act to determine the need to increase the number of forensic emergency and crisis beds to pilot mental health receiving centers. That's, that was my understanding in March. The, this yes. is what you presented in March. Uh, Okay, so uh, the one on the blue sheet is three mental health receiving centers. And the one that I have in my hand is two pilot mental health receiving centers. I'm just I am unaware of that amendment. Okay. So the one that I have dated is dated February 4th, 2020. I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, just to add, the one with the two um, pilot mental health receiving projects is dated February 4th. Um, so that one that I have dated February 4th has three pilot projects, um, Kennebec okay. County, Cumberland County, and Penobscot. Right. You're correct. So if you go through that fairly briefly, Anna, I mean, Aaron, that'd be fine. So she proposes a new title, which would be an act to establish two pilot mental health receiving centers. 
I think there's still a mic on. Um, so the mental health receiving centers would be a pilot project. Um, there'd be three of them in Kennebec County, Cumberland County, and Penobscot County um, that the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Health and Human Services would collaborate in order to divert um, from arrest persons who have come into contact with law enforcement as a result of experiencing a mental health crisis, but who are not under arrest. Um, some of the details relating to the mental health receiving center would be that it would be um, ready to provide uh, services seven days a week, 24 hours a day, which would include trained peer support, de-escalation assistance, clinical assist assessment, medication management, and identification of resources. In addition, upon arriving at the mental health receiving center, a person would be able to consult with um, and receive assistance from a peer support specialist, be assessed by a licensed clinician, consult with a psychiatric nurse practitioner, have immediate access to appropriate medications and discuss their options um, with uh, staff. And then after 24 hours of arrival at the center, the person would be connected to appropriate um, services and supports as appropriate, return home with referrals to community supports, appropriate medications, et cetera, um, connect, be connected to a crisis stabilization unit or referral to inpatient level care. In addition, the sponsor's amendment um, proposes to create um, uh, for each, excuse me, prosecution, prosecutorial district to establish a committee to determine how um, criminal or civil cases for individuals with immediate mental health needs can move forward and receive treatment and they would make recommendations in accordance with national best practice guidelines. They would be comprised of a prosecutor and a defense attorney meet on a regular basis and establish a mental health docket. From a drafting perspective, I would need to consult with um, uh, Jeanette Sedgwick, who I think drafted uh, the draft amendment for the sponsor, but I believe there might be an issue um, with um, membership of the committee being in each prosecutorial uh, district, but honestly, I can't put my fingers on the substance of that um, issue at the moment. Uh, I missed that it, a problem with the committee as drafted being what? I think that there's an issue with the, with the directing of the prosecutor um, and defense attorneys to staff the committee. Uh, or excuse me, be, participate in the committee. Um, but I but I'd have to double check um, with uh, the analyst who had originally had this bill in criminal justice. With apologies, it's, this is a little bit like listening to Urdu. But I'm having a very hard time. Um, I think we, uh, the articulation is not good. Um, I can repeat what I said. I, I don't know if that's helpful. Um, I, I just say I need, I need to consult with another analyst in my office. I can't put my fingers on at the moment exactly what the um, drafting concern was with the committee. And I apologize for that. Could, could, could we try just having Ann Perry and Colleen Madigan mute their uh, Zoom meeting and see if that helps the audio at all in the upper right hand corner. There should be the box that offers you the three dots. And if you click on it, it gives you a chance to mute or unmute or at the bottom left hand corner. I think of your screen. I think if we we might try and turn those off like the box. Uh, we did not enter zoom with audio. Sorry, off. We have no option for audio. It. If, if, if there's no mic showing up, it means we entered Zoom and denied using our computer audio. So it's not even on. Representative Hymanson, and then we'll proceed. So I, I'm still, um, I have a white piece of paper in my folder that says 
proposed committee amendment to LD 1295, an act to determine the need to increase the number of forensic emergency and crisis beds. The drafter was JPS and the date is February 4th, 2020. Um, yes. is, that okay. the one, is that the one that we're referencing now? That's my understanding. And this was my summary of that amendment. Oh, I see, I, okay. I can pull up that other document if you'd like me to. Okay, all right, because this one says two pilot programs and your narrative said three mental health receiving centers. Well, I, I guess I don't know, I, I don't understand. I have a document dated February 4th, 2020 that says three. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what the current proposal is then. And that's the copy that we have as well that has the three. That's what we were sent. Molly's raising her hand. And I'm confused because I have this one, February 4th, 2020, that talks about two pilot programs. And it's drafted um, by JPS. Does that make sense to you, Erin? Um, yes, it does. You, might, you can see it on your screen right now. But the, the only version of this amendment that I'm aware of, you can see, says three pilots. So I, I don't, I don't know what other okay, version. Okay, Molly, could you call, call on Molly? I, I, I think that we all have this one now. This, this white one. Um, Molly, wants to say something. Molly, sorry. Yeah, I think I, I believe the difference in this is that the department had um, developed an RFP for one crisis center. And so I think the um, sponsor's intent here was to fund two additional crisis centers to the one that the department was intending to fund um, with consent decree funds. And so um, I think that's where the why it says um, three, but the, the bill really only needs to establish two additional. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Perry, but then I'm still having great difficulty. People are gonna to have to articulate very slowly and very carefully because of the acoustics in here. Something is not working well. Representative Perry. Thank you. Um, I'm reading through this and I guess the question I have is, uh, it says each prosecutorial district must establish a committee to develop a plan. It's not an ongoing committee. And there's nothing that says who is particularly on that committee, I guess, um, except for there must be at least one prosecutor and one defense. Um, but uh, but the, the, and then at the end of it, it sounds like it's an ongoing committee. So I guess then is that uh, intended to be ongoing or just one time? Because it says it must uh, not, not meet less than once a month, so. Uh, Erin, did you hear and can you respond? I'm not in a position to speak to the intent uh, behind the amendment. It sounds like it's an ongoing commission um, because it looks like it would be meeting on a regular basis from the document that I have pulled up on the screen. Um, but it's, it's um, I guess I don't know what else to say about it. So my interpretation of where we are right now is we have before us an amendment from February 4th, which is now five months distant, and it has not been put into further bill language, and the, the concepts are there, um, and we can go over the concepts very briefly. I, I think we do not have enough information in front of us to be able to carry this um, to 
Well, I think we should go over the concepts briefly here, and then we're going to caucus and decide where we should go with this. So if you'd be kind enough just to, Aaron, continue on with the concepts, and then we'll have to caucus on, on how to deal with what I view as being um, an incomplete piece of uh, uh, so amendment. Sen Thank you. Senator, I believe I already summarized the extent of what I understood the amendment to be. Um, if you'd like me to go over it again, I can. Um, but I don't have any, there wasn't anything that I left off that I hadn't mentioned. It was interpreted by Representative Hymanson. She's gone through it with nothing more to add. And I couldn't understand that. Um, so where would the thoughts and from the, um, Committee members, please. If then we would have um, Commissioner uh, Pollard, I think is there as well. And whether or not she has anything else she wants to add. Commissioner Pollard, are you there? And do you wish to have anything to add at this time? Well, I appreciate being promoted to commissioner. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, um, it's our pleasure. Thank you. I, I didn't realize that that was going to be the result today. I'm glad I came. Um, the, I, I guess that just my only under recollection is that, um, from our perspective, you know, we, we are, um, interested in implementing a few demonst uh, demonstration of the receiving or crisis center we had committed to uh, already in the RFP process, the Cumberland County one for an urban demonstration. And there had been some discussion that a, a rural demonstration would also be helpful. Um, my only, I would just uh, clarify because I think there was some thought about Cumberland County not necessarily being representative of the state as a whole in terms of that being one potential demonstration site uh, that we had selected for our RFP. I would just add in terms of utilization that that is one of the highest utilizing parts of the state in terms of uh, CSUs. So to us, it, it makes sense to expand capacity there. And that from just kind of an administration or administrative capacity for our current state as an office and department, it would be challenging to manage more than two demonstration sites. Um, other than that, I, I um, fully support this model. Thank you. Um, questions from the committee, Representative Hymanson? So you have one pilot project up and running. This is the same language in the RFP for the other pilot program that's in, under consideration here. The one that you have up and running is in Cumberland. Apologies, we are not up and running. The RFP has been published, but not yet awarded. I see. And that's for one public, one pilot pro program. Correct. And this is this is the this is essentially the RFP from that one pilot program. So the request here is to establish two more: one in a rural area and one somewhere else, or. One in Penobscot, one in, in Kennebec. Okay. So that pilot program hasn't been piloted yet, the one that's out for RFP? Uh, correct. So the, the um, RFP, and I, I'm sorry, I can't with confidence speak to the intent of whether there should be three total or two total. Our RFP is just for one in Cumberland County, and we have referred to that as a demonstration rather than a pilot, a small distinction, but just that these are- Wouldn't, it be, help, wouldn't it be helpful to show that that demonstration works before we consider two more pilot programs? Yeah, I, I, I uh, understand the critique about Cumberland County potentially not being representative, so I, I you know, I think that, um, you know, I can certainly support the idea of uh, a site in addition to the one in Cumberland County. I just, 
from a capacity standpoint, think uh, implementation of of, multi, of three might be a challenge or would be a challenge. And, and as you said, the, I've referred to it as a demonstration because these are, uh, this is a service package that has demonstrated effect, efficacy elsewhere. So I wouldn't think of it as a true no, I, pilot, I understand I, that. I understand that part. I'm just trying to be very clear about this. Mm -hmm. There yep. is a demonstration project that has an RFP that's out there. Mm -hmm. You have the funds to award the RFP for a demonstration project in Cumberland. And this is a bill to fund two additional pilot programs. Um, one in, where is it? Penobscot, one in Hennebeck. One in Penobscot, one in Kennebec. Okay. But before the results of the, the, so there would be three ongoing pilot projects because they have different places to demonstrate. Is that, would that be the reason to have three of them? You know, different I'm, areas of Maine where there would be a pilot project? I'm, um, I apologize, I can't, I can't speak to the rationale for the amendment fully. I, no, that, um, that's fair, that's fair. I, I wasn't sure if it was, you know, who, whose idea was this to have three of them up and running when one of them hasn't even been demonstrated yet, although it's in a different part, so maybe. Um, yeah, and I, sh I, I should clarify that. that. Sure. We have not awarded the RFP at this point. Um, and I think it is, um, it is fair to um, want to learn from uh, one demonstration. I, I wanted to make sure I was uh, clarifying as an agreement with the point, it would be helpful to learn from that rather before wide scale implementation. But just Sorry. to be as clear as can be, that RFP is out there. It will be awarded, She's you know, if the right person comes along, all that stuff. And then you have the money for it. So it will happen. Thank you. So, is, it, is that true? Is that? So um, is that we're in a, that is the intent. Uh, of course, we are um, paying careful attention to all spending right now. Right. And, and, and we, we are going to, you know, be dealing with a funding challenge. I understand that programs that were in the, in the, the hopper, you know, may not happen because of funding challenges. I understand that, but I just want to see where this was in yes. its generation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Craven and then Representative Perry. Before, before we go on, can just a reminder thank to you. everyone to please thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mike, there's sure. a significant amount of feedback. Miss that. Oh, Representative Perry, excuse me, Representative Craven and then Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I think I like this model and I will be supporting it. I think that other people deserve services, not just people in Cumberland County. <clears throat> um, and I'm really excited and happy that the department agrees that, um, that this is a good model. And um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much, Representative Perry. Okay, I have some thoughts and perhaps a suggestion uh, for this because, for, for, first of all, part of the confusion is the title says two mental health receiving centers and the uh, in the middle of it, it says three pilot projects. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking if we could retitle this as uh, uh, possibly two demonstration projects and uh, come down knowing a demonstration project is probably in place or will be for Cumberland County, have that be one. And then redefine another one in a more a rural area of the state as a demonstration project and leave it as two uh, and do that as well. What I'm really trying to sort out is the, is still the, uh, uh, the uh, committee that has to be set up for each county uh, and really uh, what their purpose is, because it sounds like it's more than a plan. It sounds like 
that they have to meet once a month and go over all the mental health illness cases and review it and decide whether they're doing anything. Um, so I'm really trying to figure out the purpose and how that committee actually is planned to work. And I wish we had the sponsor here to sort of talk to us about that. You know, if, if there is already an RFP and this is it, can we just be, um, you know, d direct the department to create an RFP um, to establish two um, receiving centers, one in Cumberland County, one in a, reg in a rural district, and let that be that? Because I don't know that we need to put the RFP design in statute. No, we don't have to. And I think that uh, just to encourage um, that second one in a rural or a more rural county as a demonstration project. And I think uh, Dr. Pollard is right. It's not a pilot. We, you know, there certainly is much that says this work, but I think a demonstration project makes sense and uh, to do that. Uh, and I think, yeah, that we could do. Um, I think we don't really have to change much of the word, the wording in this, but except to uh, put in Cumberland County as there and a rural county and not uh, continue with that. Yeah, and I'm still just trying to figure out the committee thing on each. Thank you. Uh, so it will be resolved. Yeah. And if you'd be kind of to decide which rural county you'd like, be thinking about that while I go to uh, Senator Claxton, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd like the department to determine that. Because I'm sure there are some counties that even in the rural area, they're more ready than others and uh, give them the chance to work and find out which county would be more ready to to uh, put this kind of a project together. So an unspecified rural county. Yeah, I, I, I concur with uh, uh, making it an act to establish a rural mental health receiving center and leaving it to the department to figure out where. Unanswered is the question that uh, Representative Perry has raised about the monthly meetings of the district uh, committees. And I'm not sure that seems like a totally separate piece that at least in one county would help feed the rural pilot we're talking about or rural project we're talking about, but might not be all that helpful in others unless it's a little bit more specifically tasked. Representative Stover and then Representative Griffin. Thank you, Representative Griffin. Yes, is there a physical note on this? Physical note? How much is it going to cost? Not, not until we vote it. We don't get fiscal notes till we vote. Them. That's correct. And especially because this was a different, I'm sorry, there's still a mic on because this was a version of the bill that was proposed that's not consistent with the original bill, we wouldn't have even received a preliminary fiscal impact statement. Okay. So Thank you'll you. receive a fiscal note if you vote it out. So we can in, in essence, we're now, um, we're working towards a resolve uh, with, for two centers, one being Cumberland, the other being rural to be chosen by the, um, department, depending on their correct, um, or the criteria, and um, <clears throat> further discussion before I ask for a table of motion. Yes, Representative Perry. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm back on the committee, and, and I am thinking if this committee is to set up guidelines, uh, let's leave out the monthly meeting let them set up the guidelines and, and you know, then discuss follow through. But, I, you know, if there is no need for a monthly meeting, why are you going to meet once a month? Because you won't get the buy-in at that point. So I, I just think that, um, you know, what the committee should comprise of, you know, one prosecutor, one defense, that's fine. Uh, but just leave the monthly meeting out and that the fact that they set up guidelines and a plan for dealing with mental health uh, yeah. makes sense. 
I think it, it could be a resolve to d direct the department to create an RFP and all of that stuff can be figured out in the RFP, which is what this is, but it doesn't yeah, I would, I, need but, to go into the resolve. Right, but I do understand uh, the idea of having each prosecutorial district develop a plan. This is not about a demonstration project, but developing a plan for dealing with mental health issues in their district. So that I think is a little bit different than the second part of this, which is setting up the demonstration project. Uh, and I'm just saying, if we're going to do this, because it says each prosecutorial district is that we take out the monthly meetings, we allow them to set up the guidelines, which I think makes sense and just leave it at that. So I did just want to note, if possible, um, that uh, I, I heard from Anna, and so if I get this wrong, um, she'll jump in and correct me, but I think the key piece with the committee here that need, would need to be worked out by this committee, HHS, is the, the issue of who is, who is doing the appointment, whether it's um, the governor uh, doing an appointment or not. I don't think you can just identify a particular district attorney or defense attorney, you need to say that somebody is appointing a person who is a prosecutor or representing prosecutors or a person representing who is a defense attorney or representing defense attorneys. And if I get that wrong, Anna will correct me. Maybe we don't have to define who has to be appointed, but that, that each prosecutorial district will set up a committee. To, to, to look at uh, mental, how mental health issues are, are, are uh, taken care of in that district uh, and let them make the decision. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if we can direct the prosecutorial districts to do that. So that's something that I'll check out. Senator Moore, Senator Moore. Yes, thank you. Um, and listening to this whole conversation going back and forth, I, I, I agree with what Representative Craven was saying about other parts of the state, especially in rural Washington County. Uh, but I really do think that we should give the department an opportunity to have the one pilot program that has the RFP that is out there right now. You know, let's see how that goes before we go into you know, having the department, you know, telling the department they have to do this and requiring another uh, committee be set up. I, I think we really do need to give it an opportunity to see how it works in Cumberland County or how the RFP that is out there before we proceed with any further uh, any further action on this bill. That's, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Senator Moore. Um, and I think, um, are there other comments? Because then I think we'll table this, caucus, and then come back and, and vote. And really the issue you've just brought up is should this be one, should it be two? Um, and are we going to learn something different from those two different experiments? Move to, from, move to table. Move to table, Senator Claxton seconded. Seconded. All in favor of tabling in the room. Unanimous in the room, thank you. Um, Moving on to the third um, work session, LD2141 resolve to ensure continued service for children with disabilities by imposing a delay on main care rulemaking until an impact study has been completed. Um, I think I would turn to Erin um, again, and then we have the sponsor in the room. This is, I'm sorry, our turn. You're Anna's Anna. now. I'm here, sorry. Uh, okay, LD2141. Um, so this is a bill that hasn't had a work session yet. Um, you probably remember that the original bill was delaying a proposed school-based services rule um, until an impact study was carried out, uh, including input from uh, the CDS study, which was required in the budget. And then the department would put together a report. And can I, can I just, uh, just stop you for a second? The acoustics are, are bad enough that if you, can you speak a little bit slower? Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank, okay. Thank you. <laughs> So um, this was a proposed rule that the department had put together and the original bill was delaying that 
proposed rule until um, a, an impact study was carried out and then that required the department to put together a report that would come to you and then the following rules would be made a substantive. Since the bill was submitted, the rule was pulled by the department. Um, at the same time, there was also um, a petition going on behind the scenes um, with the signatures that were that was prepared but wasn't submitted because I, I think because the rule was um, pulled. And then um, you have a couple of things today that are in your folders and um, also um, online. Uh, you have um, a memo from Molly and she is here and you also still have uh, Tiffany Haskell who's been waiting um, all morning. Um, she is present from Maxby if you have some questions for them. Uh, the only, uh, for her, for her, I should say, um, and the only other piece of information I wanted to bring to you before you move to um, perhaps the sponsor um, was the status for the PCG report. That's the Public Consulting Group. I always have to look up that acronym. Um, they are doing the Child Development Services Study, which is, um, that study was required in the budget. And there is a preliminary cost study report that is due in October to the Education Committee. Uh, they plan, that committee plans to meet in October and to discuss that um, preliminary report. And in that report, PCG will make some recommendations as to what um, PCG thinks the state could do with um, the services that are currently provided by CDS. And then based on those recommendations, the Education uh, committee can pick one of those recommendations of some sort and then PCG will prepare a second report with an implement, implementation plan for whatever the recommendation is that the committee chooses, that committee chooses, um, and that would be due December the 1st. So that's um, the pr progress report on that. So you also have, um, as I said, you have a memo from Molly, you have Tiffany, and you also have um, a, an amendment from the sponsor, from Representative Meyer. And whenever you're ready to talk about that, Representative Meyer, I can bring that up on the screen for you. Thank you very much. Um, questions for Anna, otherwise I'm gonna to go to Representative Meyer and then we'll go to um, the esteemed Ms. Bogart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this, um, the amendment um, narrows the original bill to isolate rulemaking for developmental preschools to be major substantive and um, all other um, school-based services remain routine technical. Um, we've also struck that aspect of the amendment that um, um, directed that any of the routine technical uh, rules be done um, while we're in session. These were changes that were made. These were amendments that were made with following discussions with Molly. Molly also um, uh, indicated today that um, there were some concerns about disallowing emergency rules that could impact other changes that might need to be made in the context of COVID. And so um, we've agreed that there could be a COVID exception, which Anna is working on, has worked on. And you can see that, that's the yellow bit. which is to say, quote, the department may not adopt rules pursuant to this action um, as an emergency unless it is a response to a state of emergency declared by the governor. Thank you. Are there questions at all for Representative uh, Meyer? Some of the initial testimony we got uh, about the having major substance of rules, questions from the department. Um, 
that there are many different areas that the department deals with, um, and it may um, it may it be very difficult to have all these agencies have to get together. And I think there were I kind of 15 different areas of school um, interventions. And um, how are you going to answer that, Representative Meyer? I'm going to ask Molly to weigh in. Representative Meyer, you're a wise woman. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, other questions for Representative Meyer? Otherwise, Molly, if you join us, thank you. Sure. sure. Um, is there, I'm sorry, is there a specific question that you'd like me to answer? Would you like me to go through the memo that responds to um, questions about why we need to do um, these rule changes or how can I help? <laughs> if you would do the latter, yes, that'd be fine. And then my question was simply, is this going to be too cumbersome uh, for the department if they're all major substantive? Sure, um, I'm going to share my screen with the memo. Um, so I believe everyone can see that now. Um, this is a memo that uh, thanks to Anna, I believe you received yesterday. Um, and responds specifically to a question about what federal rules um, or um, federal requirements are we out of compliance with that precipitate the need for um, th these rule changes. So these are pulled directly from some materials that the department shared with stakeholders in one of our first stakeholder meetings around this issue. Um, and so I'm just gonna highlight the concerns that were noted and then the responses to those. Um, so the first concern that was noted is that this limits the ability to reimburse for services in a school that are not written into an IF, IEP or an IFSP. And um, what is required by the federal government is that CMS, well, by CMS is that health related services required through IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education um, Act be present on a student's IEP, IFSP to be eligible for reimbursement. And there is no state flexibility um, to get around those rules. And so the reason that we need this rule change is that main care policy currently is not clear that um, to mirror this requirement by CMS. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Molly on the topic of that first concern? Seeing none, please continue. Please. Um, and then, to respond to a concern that we are limiting um, a child's or, uh, programming. There here are additional requirements that um, health-related services required through IDEA must be aligned with a student's IS IEP or IFSP to be eligible for reimbursement. And again, there's no uh, main care flexibility here. Um, it's federal law that we have to comply with in order to receive uh, federal reimbursement. Um, the next regulation is that services required through the IDEA cannot be billed outside of the education program. So um, if there is a service that um, could be provided through the education program, then it must be, um, well, could be billed, excuse me, through the education program, then it must be. And um, main care's flexibility here is that we may pay for services in addition to those required through IDEA through an appropriate section of policy. And so um, this will allow those um, services to be provided outside of um, the school setting if necessary. Um, and then, you know, the next barrier is that main care is not allowed to provide uh, to fund childcare um, since it is not a medical service. And so those, um, those funding needs would need to be met elsewhere other than um, main care ser services that are billed to main care. Um, Thank you. So my takeaway so far is that only on the second line there, the second box, uh, that is where there's some flexibility, but it doesn't really relate to the, the this bill, which has to do with um, major substantive. Yeah, and and um, I think that's that's the correct read and. Um, this, the question that I received that this mem memo responds to is what are the federal requirements that are precipitating this? And so that's really all that this um, responds to, but that is, that is correct. 
Um, and then the last part of the uh, sorry, a question from Representative Hymanson? Um, no, I just have a comment. A comment from Later on. No, please continue, Molly. Well, I, <laughs> I was actually going to say I, I won't uh, read you this, this last piece unless you'd like me to. It's just some additional context. So I'm um, happy to take questions or, or hear comments, and then um, I'm happy to respond to the amendment as well. Yeah, so when I when I heard this bill originally, I I, um, I thought we already had a process to 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 deal with this. So in my past, you know, six years, twice in the previous administration, there were emergency rules that happened during between the sessions. <coughs> Excuse me, I got something caught in my throat from I don't know something in my mask. But <clears throat> Excuse me for a sec. No, I think I'm just, and, um, so, um, <clears throat> so we had, um, we had the, the service, um, the service providers, this was childcare came to us and said, you know, these rules are going to, are going to tank our programs. And so we need to get back out of them. So there was a process, um, that um, we used in order to call the HHS back into um, in, into committee to review the rules with a public hearing. So there is a process when um, something like this happens. However, what I'm learning now is that it is it is not a process that's well known. Number one, and it does take some doing to get a petition. It's a petition drive. It could be one person who's affected or a hundred people in a petition to, um, to get this. So there is a kind of fail safe um, process for voting, for getting rules to change. But we also thought that it was not the right thing to do for major rules that are really going to affect a very vulnerable group to be able to happen in between the session or an emergency where we, would, we the legislature, wouldn't be able to stop it. And so um, I think this is another good backstop that the department has agreed um, they could work with. And I think that's important because we don't wanna put the department in a situation where they are responding to an emergency or have some rules they have to promulgate because of federal guidelines, whatever. And um, this, this stops them having major substantive rules um, from doing that. That would be an, Im an impediment and would make a new problem happen. So I'm glad that the department has said, you know, they can work with this. And it, I think it also does allow for um, caution with new rules so that the apple cart isn't upset for um, kids with um, developmental disorder. So I just am saying that so you understand my thinking switch. Um, and I, I appreciate this amendment. Thank you very much, Representative Hymanson. Are there others who wish to add anything else? Let me just look at the screen. Anybody off campus? Uh, seeing none, I would uh, look for a motion to table, please. Uh, Senator Claxton would table and seconded by um, Representative Stover or, and third by Representative Perry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and at this time, we've been through the three. Oh, I'm sorry, you're correct. All in favor of tabling, unanimous in the room. At this time, we've been through the three work sessions. So we're going to have a caucus, which I suspect is going to last anywhere from 10 to 18 minutes. And we will resume. Thank you very much. We will then take up votes and we will go through the amendments.
test one, two, testing room audio.
This is a test. This is a test of the audio in the room. We're trying to make some adjustments to the audio in the room. This is a test. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, reconvene the HHS committee. It's now 2 o'clock, 2.01, and we're going to um, take up the three bills that we did with work sessions, um, and they have to be taken off the table and then voted discussions, et cetera, and then we'll go through the amendments. So um, starting off with 8.03, uh, entertain a motion to take this off the table. Representative Hymanson, seconded by Representative Meyer. Um, all in favor, unanimous in the room. Um, proceeding ahead, <coughs> I will turn to um, Senator Claxton for a motion. Um, yeah, it, yes. Which one do I have that? So my suggestion is that we, I move that we accept elements of the bill that are the dollar amounts carried forward for the uh, funding for the Department of Health and Human Services to contract for additional mental health crises, intervention services that provide an alternative to criminal justice. And eliminate everything else. And I'm, I'm the last phrase was? I missed the last phrase. I missed your final statement. Yes. No. What was your last, last statement? Line. Oh, my last line is an emit, eliminate the specifications of where the money is to go and any of the things in there that direct the department to. Thank you. Um, has that been seconded? Representative Meyer? And then I want to, right, we'll go next to Aaron. question. Um, so I understand the directive, but um, sorry, there's a mic on. Um, so are you, you want me to add up all the dollar amounts and then just put them under one directive to the department for these crisis services? Is that correct? Or do you have another dollar amount? Yes, add them up, to, they come to 4.4 something. Okay. Any other questions from Aaron? Any other questions? Any further discussion? Could you, could you read back? Can you read back what you have, Erin? Yep, so my understanding is, you can't, sorry, the mic. Okay, so um, my understanding. I did, I did. My understanding is that you want me to add up all the amounts of appropriations from the sponsor's proposed amendment. If you, and you think it's about $4.4 million and that the um, initiative language for that appropriation would be that the money would be directed to the Department of Health and Human Services for crisis intervention services um, in order to direct uh, persons from the criminal justice system. Did I get that right? That's my understanding. Yes, Representative Perry, further discussion? Yeah, I, I would like to add uh, that the department be using best practices for crisis services in order to, uh, I would like to add that language if possible. Thank you, we actually did discuss that at our caucus too. Erin, adding in uh, using best practices, department will be adhering uh, to best practices. Okay. Or evidence-based, which you intend, or is that something different? Senator Claxton, can you accept that? Said, sorry, one moment. Um, sorry to interject. We got an audio issue. Briefly, one second. Sorry. So, Senator Claxton, that's okay. Is a friendly amendment? Yes. Thank you. Are we ready for a vote? Sorry, I had a question if, if by best practices, evidence-based practices is the same thing, which is what we've used in the past or whether best practices mean something else. I, I couldn't. Erin, I think we did not hear you. So it's, 
Um, I'm trying to figure out whether Representative Perry's friendly amendment to have the it be best practices is identical to the term evidence-based practices, which is something we've used um, in the past in committee, or whether or whether this means something else. I, I'm sorry, what I'm not hearing is when you the word before practices. Evidence-based. Or evidence-based. Thank you. Yes, yeah. that would work great. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. This is a challenge to our elocutionary excellence. Oh, thank you. So that's accepted as a friendly amendment. I turn it over friendly, to yes. Allison. Take the vote. All in favor of the current motion. Those in favor, Representative Meyer, Representative Stover, Representative Perry, Rep Senator Gratwick, Senator Claxton, Representative Hymanson, Representative Craven, Representative, and that's it. That's it. I think so. I did. Thank you. All opposed? Representative Griffin. Thank you very much. And um, the others have a chance to vote until tomorrow. Yeah. Moving on to the vote on LD1295, an act to determine the need to increase the number of forensic emergency and crisis beds. I turn to Representative Perry. Yes, I, I would like to make a motion to pass as amended, being amended that the first section about creating a state action plan for immediate needs, because we're directing uh, prosecutorial districts, it is not within our realm. So I think we need to leave that out. Uh, and then to, uh, then to, uh, and maybe we have to change the top, but we, I want to talk about demonstration projects. Uh, and that is to uh, bring forth a demonstration project in Cumberland County and have the department look at a second demonstration project in a more rural county um, with some of the language the same, but leaving the described counties out, I think that decision should belong to the um, department. And uh, because we don't know who's really ready to do that. Uh, and then uh, the mental health receiving center can stay and um, the rest of it can stay uh, the way it is. And maybe change this to, uh, you know, an act to establish uh, to demonstration projects instead of pilot. May I ask I a clarifying question? Sure. Aaron? Um, when you say that the mental health there's feedback. Um, Representative Perry, when, when you... Uh, Representative Perry, when you say that... I'm sorry, there's still a mic on. It's really hard to hear. Representative Perry, when you say that the mental health... Mental health receiving centers. When you say that they should stay... What does that mean? Oh, uh, the, the uh, titles uh, on the, and the amendment, the mental health receiving center, that no changes. Uh, and then up the next section or whatever you want to call it, title is upon arrival at the mental health receiving center that will remain unchanged. Okay, so my understanding, I'm sorry, can someone please mute their microphone? Oh, um, off. Thank you. Um, so my, under my understanding is that um, you want to create, you want to direct the department to create, uh, to develop an RFP for two demonstration projects, one in Cumberland County and one in a more rural county, and you want the elements of the, the mental health receiving centers that are on the amendment. <laughs> Okay, it's staying on. My, my mic wasn't staying on when I put it on. Uh, 
No. <laughs> What I am asking is that the department uh, work towards uh, one center in Cumberland County that they're doing now, okay, and consider a second site in a more rural county. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the have to do an RFP, however they choose to do it, but we'll let them decide. And, and then the rest of this will remain the same. And uh, I would just as soon change the title from pilot to demonstration. Um, and that, and that, was the, that was the change. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm still having, I still have some questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. It was my understanding from Dr. Pollard that there is already an RFP in play, not yet awarded for Cumberland County. Yeah, so if I could just uh, say a, a resolve to create an RFP for one uh, demonstration project in an, a rural area um, that is that mimics the one already in progress in Cumberland County. Does that make sense, Erin? Get the intention? Yes, that that's what I thought it was. I'm sorry, it's, can, can you shut off the mic, please? I, I, I that's, I think I understand that aspect. I, I get confused when you say you want the language of which is just bullet points um, the, of the mental health receiving center and those guidelines to stay. Are, do you, are you wanna create that program like in statute somewhere? Or are you talking about having those be elements of a project that the department is creating or something else? The intent is that this will be a duplication of the Cumberland County project in a, a rural setting. So I, I, but none of the other none of the other language for the RFP needs to go into the resolve. So the totality totality of the resolve is that the department shall create a um, a um, demonstration receiving project that is um, uh, similar to the one being created in Cumberland County. Is, okay. And nothing about the language that's in the, in the amendment um, proposed with regard to the mental health receiving centers. You just want it to mimic the existing project that's underway in Cumberland County. Yes. Thank you. It, but we're not going to do any of the language about what a mental health receiving center does. It's already part of the Cumberland County one. I think our intent is just just to create another one in an, a, a rural place. Okay. So that yeah, that mirrors anyway what Cumberland County is doing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, further suggestions for Erin before I ask her to repeat what we're going to be voting on? Uh, let me look on the screen, seeing none. Erin, would you be kind enough then to repeat what it is we're going to be voting on? Yes, so my understanding is that Representative Perry, can someone please mute their microphone? My understanding is that Representative Perry is moving on to pass as amended. I don't think we've had a second yet because I am sorry I interrupted with all my questions, um, but that you would strip the bill and it would become a resolve and the resolve would direct the department to create a demonstration project in a rural area that mimics the, the, the one that's in progress already in Cumberland County and then also obviously the title would need to change and that 
Representative Perry likes the term demonstration project rather than pilot project instead. And I would ask if possible, if I could work with the department um, on developing some of this language to make sure that it matches their existing program. Thank you. That's my understanding. Representative Perry concurs. So we now have a motion. Is there that been seconded? Seconded by Representative Stover. Further discussion? People are ready for a vote. Um, Allison? So we're going to vote on um, the amendment, excuse me, on the amendment just um, stated. All in favor, yes. Sure. Those in favor, Representative Hymanson, Senator Gratwick, Representative Meyer, Senator Claxton, Representative Stover, Representative Perry, Representative Craven. Thank you. Um, all opposed? Those opposed, Representative Griffin. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to LD2141. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry to interrupt, Senator. Um, I, I was, we, we need a little more information on LD803. Um, Representative Griffin did not vote in favor of the motion, and I, I need her minority report. Just ought not to pass. Thank you. Was there an was there a minority report on twelve ninety five? I didn't catch it. No. And if there, and so what is that minority report? Ought not to pass. N no, just ought not to pass. Thank you. Then moving on to. 2141, resolved to ensure continued services for children with disabilities by imposing a delay on main care rule, real rulemaking until an impact study is completed. So, um, Representative Hymanson. I'll make a motion not to pass as amended. Second. Seconded Senator Claxton. Discussion? Let me just look online. Is there any discussion online? Seeing none. Um, excuse me. All in favor of the current motion? Those voting in favor of the motion, Representative Hymanson, Senator Gratwick, Representative Meyer, Senator Claxton. Representative Stover, Representative Perry, Representative Craven, and Representative Griffin. We're going to move on to our amendment reviews, of which we have seven. <clears throat> but it turns out I left my notebook out uh, outside. So you can, can you start this off, please? All right. So amendment reviews 1134. Yes. So um, I just need to share my screen. So please hold on a second while I do that. Um, LD1134 um, is the bill that had to do with federal block grants and federally recognized Indian nations, tribes, and bands in the state. There are two reports uh, to this bill. Um, the, and I, sorry, I just wanted to first say that I've gotten a number of questions about um, 
or comments about public participation and amendment review. And just to clarify, all of these bills are bills that have already received a public hearing with public input and had a work session and committee. And this is an opportunity for the committee to make sure that the language that I've drafted matches their intent. Uh, so there are two reports here, a majority and a minority report. Um, the first one um, you'll see here is the majority report. I've marked up what is different from the language that you voted on um, that was presented by the stakeholders um, and committee. Um, some of it was the same, but also some of what was changed. So the first thing is that the title is changed um, because previously it had to do with block grants for certain communities, which is broader than what the bill ended up um, focusing on. Uh, the, this uh, statute that's proposed in this report um, proposes to set aside an amount of 12% of the total amount of block grant funds. And I don't think my screen, I didn't actually share my screen, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, th I think that's where we are now. Um, so the new titles at the top, block grant funds, the piece about the 12% is in this section here. The, the version of um, language that you saw at the work session indicated um, that qualified block grants would have a set aside amount equal to at least 12% of the total amount. Um, I removed the word qualified here because there was not direction from the committee or on this, the members of the committee on this report about what would make a block grant qualified to have a percentage taken off. So if there is, if there are qualifications, I can add those in. But typically when we talk about qualified block grants, there's some kind of criteria indicating how they might be different than others. Um, so, I, so for now, I took that out without further guidance. Um, in addition, um, the amendment you saw in, in the work session talked about having the tribal district administer the grants um, that, have, that have come off the block grants uh, to those groups. And uh, because tribal district is a defined term in the public health section of statutes, we added a cross-reference um, to that definition just to, to make sure everything is uh, tied together. The, uh, the fiscal note rather, um, a fiscal note is required here. Um, it says that um, if the remaining 88% of federal block grant funds are not sufficient to accomplish purposes of the programs that are not uh, modified to account for reduction in expenditures with the 12% now being uh, set aside for Indian nations, tribes and bands that general fund appropriations may be needed to supplement um, those programs. Um, I'll move on to the minority report unless there are questions on the or direction with the majority. And um, hearing none, I'll keep going. Uh, so the minority, I'm looking at the minority report and I would keep the emergency preamble. Yes. And we can um, change the date to something that's more meaningful. Right. So the question about the emergency preamble um, was more about whether you uh, were satisfied with my creative writing or whether you wanted me to change something. Yes, I, I am. Okay. This one would direct the department to engage in um, consultation with the tribal communities for all block grants received by the state. And that by uh, May 1st, the department would enter into an MOU with the federally recognized nations, tribes and bands regarding the block grant funds. So um, the state has uh, passed and I was wondering what you'd like to do with that. Um, move it. <laughs> so no later than um, uh, how about if we if we have you know that ninety days after enactment language. Um, so one. One of the tricky parts of that in this context is that if you want it, um, 90, okay, so sorry, it would pass as an emergency. So it would go into effect immediately upon uh, being finally passed. And right, so 90 days, um, I guess, uh, from when this would pass because of the emergency. So I think we're good. Does that, did that make sense? Yeah. Or did I just confuse everybody? Yeah. Uh, and there, then you have um, another 
Yeah, some a date yeah. here. Yeah, sorry, I'm just making sure I'm keeping up. So um, in the review and uh, processing of this report, um, there was a question about whether you wanted a report back date of the status of the MOU and those consultations. Um, yeah, Actually. end of January, 2021. Do you want the authority to report out legislation? Yes. Okay, that's it for um, 11.34, unless there's okay. any other. So, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the fiscal note on this one too. Um, similarly, that if the MIU identifies a portion a, a higher portion of federal block grant funds to go to the federally recognized nations, tribes, and bands that, um, and the programs are not modified, uh, then general fund appropriations would be needed. All right, so moving to 2099, do we have language for 2099? Yes. Okay. Um, so what we have is this um, bill has not finished going through uh, processing, but what I can share with you and go through is the markup of the amendment that I've uh, submitted, sent over to the revisor's office. Okay. And um, we have a, a fiscal note um, about uh, on this bill as well. So do you want me to walk through that with you? Yes. Okay. Um, one thing I want to say off the top, <laughs> because I freaked myself out last night, was that when I've crossed something off completely, it just means I'm taking it out of the bill as proposed. It does not mean that this amendment would repeal that section of law. So I had a minor panic attack last night when I thought that I removed the definition of inherently hazardous substances in cultivation area, but that's not the case. They, those, how they exist in statute right now is how they will remain the crossouts are simply removing it from the bill so that nothing about those sections of law are being amended by this committee amendment. Um, so, um, but starting here with A1, this uh, change here is because the definition of harvested marijuana already includes marijuana products and marijuana concentrate. Same thing with the definition of batch number um, in 1H. So the result of this is that those definitions are not modified uh, by this amendment. Um, cultivation area, you're not changing anything about those requirements. Those removes the provisions. And again, it's not repealing that section. It's just not making, it's just removing it from the bill. Um, section A4 here on immature marijuana plant and section A7 on seedling, you decided to remove the provisions regarding seedling size. And so that's why they were removed here from the bill. Hold, hold, hang on a second just for a minute, Aaron. Sure. Okay, sorry. You want me to yeah. continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, the provision relating to inherently hazardous substance, the proposal was to include alcohol or ethanol in that definition. The committee decided not to change this definition. So it's removing this change um, from the bill, but that inherently hazardous substance definition still exists um, the way that it is right now. Okay, so just remind me, so when you have something crossed out, it doesn't mean it's, it means it's, it's, it's not part of this bill. It is right. still, it, it's still in. So as an example, inherent, inherently hazard, hazardous substance is still there in the law. It's just not in this part, of, not in this bill. That's correct. It's not being changed in this okay. amendment anymore. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, in part B, um, there's a couple of changes here. One is related to the definition of harvested marijuana and it's just a cleanup piece. Um, 
the other one, the rest of the labeling requirement here is consistent with the language that you saw from the Office of Marijuana Policy at the work session with one change. Um, there was a question on review about um, how, so this, this says that the department, that labeling wouldn't be required until the department determines there's sufficient capacity among testing facilities. Um, and the question came up about how would the members of the public know that there would be sufficient capacity. So in consultation with OMP um, and which is consistent with language in the adult use law relating to cultivation facility licenses, um, there's a suggestion here of having the department shall post on its publicly accessible website the date on which the department has determined that sufficient capacity among marijuana testing facilities exists. And, that and can I just ask, so this is a first pass really for us on yes. this language, right? And you'll, you'll give it to us as a cleanup with cleanup language. So it's gonna to come to us again. It's and gonna look different. I, 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 it's gonna to come to you again at some point. I don't know if it'll be ready by Wednesday, the next time we meet or not, but you, you'd at least see it by email again. Could we, could, we, um, could we have it ready by Wednesday so we can look at it physically? You Everyone's know. doing their best. I, I don't know. I can't promise that. Everyone's doing their best to move okay. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just, yeah. Representative Stover. I would like to actually um, request reconsideration of our, um, of our position on this from the last time. I think that there's pieces of this that are unusually restrictive to small business, the small mom and pop operations, and that some of the language in here was ideally to bring med the medical and the residential in alignment or closer in congruence. And I don't think this accomplishes that as well. So I would really like to request that reconsideration of this bill. And Thank I you. second that motion. Okay, and you're, are you on, you're on the prevailing side? Not the prevailing side. Prevailing side, okay. All right, so a motion and a second to reconsider. All in favor? Uh, okay, motion passes. So the, we, it's on the table now again. Did you wanna talk about it, Holly? Or did somebody wanna talk about it? Um, I think that I, I, I started um, some of the things that are in here, um, some of the fines, for instance, that uh, the fine structures that are proposed would be unusually prohibitive to a small business. Um, and if what we're trying to ultimately do is to um, attract and sustain small business, this wouldn't be the way to go about it. The other is that we're still waiting for the completion um, of the residential rules. And this seems like we're going backwards into the medical rules um, when we haven't completed the other, when there's mention in here that what we're trying to do is to, to bring some, um, um, some alignment or some um, alignment between the two sets of rules. You can't really do that if you haven't completed the first and are beginning to modify this that already exists. Um, so I think it's, I think there's some structural things in here that could be re-examined and I think it could come back, but I think as written, this is not the vehicle that it was intended. And that's why I'm requesting the reconsideration. Thank you. If I may clarify, Representative Stover, um, I hadn't gotten to that. I'm sorry, can someone mute their mic? Um, I hadn't gotten to that point yet, but all of the fine structure has been removed in this amendment. And, it, and I'm not sure in which part addresses your second part, Point, but all of Part D, which is the fine structure, was voted on the committee to be removed and is not part of this committee amendment. Yeah, that was my understanding too, that we took away the fine structure. Yes, Senator Claxton. It's, it's my sense that uh, we had one work session on this and it's 14 pages long and it just changed radically and I don't think we can do it justice. So I'm gonna be inclined to vote ONTP, but not to pass and kill it. 
Uh, all right, so I have a motion and a second on the table. Uh, any discussion? So I, I would like to say that um, I've had a big, a long journey with medical marijuana, and I um, came from a place as a physician of not understanding what it really did. And through my journey as, you know, uh, chair, co-chair of a small group to rewrite the medical marijuana regulations, um, I really delved into it and from a medical viewpoint and listened hard at the public hearings and came to understand that even though there isn't medical evidence of um, well-designed trials, because that's not possible in the environment um, uh, because it's federally um, not used, not, you're not able to really develop trials. Um, that I came to understand it as a, as a medical substance. So I fully embraced it as a medical substance. What I also heard from people during that, that is if it's a medical substance, then you have to treat it like a medicine. And that means you have to label the bottles and you have to put that there's no pesticide and that there's no heavy metals and that there is a certain percentage of THC, CBD, um, and whatever the terpenes are, and that that's very important because you're treating it as a medicine. So I'm, I'm very attached to the part of this that says this has to have labels on it. Um, after we did this and we took this vote, I got a call from two people who were very grateful for what I said and they told me two heart-stopping stories. One was a story of a, a woman who had a mother with dementia and she was giving her mother with dementia some medical marijuana, um, which calmed her down and made it easier for her life. She trusted the caregiver and she would get an unlabeled container from the trusted caregiver well, it turns out one of the batches that she got was not labeled because none of them are. She, trust, she used her trust and it contained too much something and sent her mother into a slow spiral that led her to hospitalization and to a psychiatric hospitalization for weeks before she stabilized. And so she said, if she knew from a label on the container how much it, it, it you know, the, the, what the compounds were, she would treat it because she was treating it like a medication. The other was a woman who had PTSD and depended on the, the label on her container. And her caregiver gave the labels, and that's the reason why she went to this caregiver. So. I think it's really important to treat it like a medication. This bill does that. I understand you know, why you wanna revote it and, and what the pressures are, but I think there are no, there are no um, uh, we took away the fines. We took away most of everything that was, was uh, really a problem in this bill. And we kept things that I think define this as a medication. So I am gonna support the ought not to pass vote because I think it can come back next session. We're almost at next session and bring it back, but I am gonna stand firm that medical marijuana is a medicine and that's what I've been told and that's what I've learned and we need to treat it that way. And um, the pushback from the caregivers has been that they can't they, they, it undercuts their ability to work. Well, it's a medicine. You have to treat it like that. You are in that, you are growing it to be a medication. So you, that's all I heard about for two years was it's a medicine. So I'm just gonna be clear about that part of it when we come back to the 130th. I'll support this motion. Um, not that I like it, but I will support it. Mike, all right, so I'm going to call the vote. Um, all in favor of the ought not to pass motion. Those in favor, Representative Hymanson. 
Senator Gratwick, Representative Meyer, Senator Claxton, Representative Stover, Representative Perry, Representative Craven. Abby's on her way back in, Griffin. Anyway, uh, it's a not not to pass vote. Yes. Are you raising your hand? Okay, great. All Representative right. Griffin. So that's unanimous of those in the room. Okay, so that's that, Erin. That takes that off your plate, huh? Um, Twenty fifty six. Um, resolve to create the Frequent User System Engagement Collaborative. Oh, sorry. Can we do 1946? I opened the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, 2056 is the third one on this salmon piece of paper. Okay. Um, 2056, you saw this last week. The only reason I'm bringing it back, so you changed the date. Um, the only reason I'm bringing it back is because when I got back to my office, a fiscal note had magically appeared and it does not need to be adjusted based on the date that um, you decided on in committee. So I wanted you to see the fiscal note. So it says a fiscal note is required, but costs are expected to be minor and can be absorbed. All right, any questions from anyone? Seeing none, thank you. Oops. Um, so we have uh, 1946. So this one to also, improve access to mental and behavioral health care by providing care in clinical, reproductive, and sexual health care settings. So um, this bill, just like the medical marijuana bill, is still in processing. So this language is identical to the language that you saw presented from the sponsor at the work session. A couple of things I wanted to point out um, based on the review so far is that I think it's going to say behavioral health services. Um, for It makes more sense grammatically. Um, and I have accidentally referred to the program throughout this resolve, um, but it'll be changed to pilot project because that's what the committee had decided about pilot project um, implementation. I'm bringing it back now um, because there are a couple of dates that the committee should review, um, as well as I can show you um, the fiscal note uh, um, that was done in March. So. Um, this, requi this bill requires the department to enter into contracts by January 1st, 2021 to implement the, pr the, the project and that the, the pilot operates from 18 months after that the contracts have been awarded. So um, this bill does not have an emergency on it. And so I wanted to make sure that what the new date should be, if any. Anyone have a suggestion about a date? Three months after enactment, how about that? Does that work? Okay. So within 90 days, nine. within 90 days of the effective date of this legislation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also a report back date um, of January 1, 2022, um, which would be at the conclusion. Yeah, that's know. okay. That's okay. That, that's all right. Okay. Yeah. And then I believe this fiscal note, we'll have to check with Luke, um, but this is, that you, the, the bill would appropriate $75,000 um, annually for the um, for the pilot project. And so if this changes because of the date, I will let you know. Um, 1856. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. No, nope. we can go on. Going to go on to the next. So you 18... saw both of those. <laughs> Sorry, representative. <laughs> go ahead. 1856, is that where we are? Resolved to support individuals with acute mental health needs. Yes. So you saw this bill last week, um, uh, but I, we did receive the fiscal notes and both majority and minority reports. So that's why I'm bringing it back to you to see. Um, but before that, 
Um, the, I wanted to talk a, a language question on the majority report. Well, actually, and on the minority report too, but these pieces are the same. So um, under the language as it was said that the department shall amend its rule. And I'm just reading now, I don't have this up on the screen. Pursuant to this section in time to be submitted to the United States Department of Health and Human Services Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services with an effective date of the reimbursement required by this section of July 1, uh, 2020. So um, in working with the advisor's office and Anna, who knows more about main care than I do, um, I understand that rules can simultaneously both go through the rulemaking process and be submitted to CMS. And so it was thought that instead of um, amending its rule in time to be submitted, now that you have this date certain, which is the effective date of this section, that there would be a time certain of 30 days following the effective date of the section. But this is just a suggestion if you would like a different time frame, um, that's fine, you just can let me know. I think that's fine, keep that. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the fiscal notes. Uh, just so you know, this appropriation is from the old information. That's why it's crossed off. Um, so you can see that in fiscal year 2020 to 2021, there's an approximately $74,000 um, general fund appropriation with also some federal expenditures. And I believe the minority report is similar, which I'm just scrolling down except because it has a termination date, you don't see it projected out here and that this amount is lower. All right. Anything else with that one? Uh, 1856, okay, so 1760. This second one you will end. Yeah, this is the second time okay. around. Um, you've already seen this language. I went through it in detail. I'm not going to do that again. Um, I wanted to sh just attach it so you could see what the fiscal note was um, related to. And it shows that because of the dates that you chose, there wouldn't be any appropriation for this current fiscal year, but it's projected to cost about $1 million in, uh, in the future for the first year and then up to $11 million in, in further, in, excuse me, later fiscal years. Okay. And the last one, drum roll, 1954, an act to amend the laws governing uh, estate recovery under the main care program. We also went through this last week. Um, I'm not gonna go through the language again. Um, this appropriation, I, I forgot to cross it off, but it's based on the old information the new information is contained in the fiscal note here, which shows that in the first year it'd be approximately 248,000 and then projected to be about 419,000 of general fund uh, to make these changes to the estate recovery program. Okay, any questions from the committee about these? Uh, okay. Thank you, Erin, very much for that work. Is there any other business? <laughs> I look for an. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would I... like to commend everybody for, for lasting this long, and I'm happy to stay around with Representative Perry for a little bit longer. Um, I... But so we will meet a week from uh, now, 10 o'clock in the morning. We, I think we'll have two or three things just to follow up, and then mainly we'll be talking about 1961. Um, and um, Representative Hymanson and I will send off to the members of the, uh, of the committee a list of questions and problems to be solved with that uh, by uh, Friday afternoon. That's our, our goal. And then I would I urge you to talk, we should talk amongst ourselves. Remember, it has to be just one-on-one. -on -one. Talk with advocates 
so we can come up with a solution. Uh, we really do not have the option of going beyond next Wednesday. So if we're gonna do something with this, we are gonna basically have to come to a more or less of a solution um, going into the meeting. It, we, we do not have the option of crim criminal justice. Um, I, I went over this with leadership and so they have a special circumstance there, which is not open to us. So we, we're gonna, our feet are gonna be the fire if we're gonna make this one move forward. I think there are some ways, personally, that we can have a, a reasonably good compromise on this. And the usual definition of a compromise is nobody is happy. But that's, um, I think we can get so nobody's happy and get so at least some people are happy. So any other thoughts? Um, and I th just to echo, echo, echo um, what we've heard here too, I'd never want to be in this chamber again in this circumstance. This is just a, a torture chamber. Um, having said that, any other comments? Uh, yes, uh, Senator, uh, your bill folders for members who are in Augusta, Allison has those available to you outside the chamber as you leave. Um, and for members who are not here, um, we will, ha and I can send this to the whole committee, but email you a scanned version of the master file that has all the materials from the public hearing and both work sessions that we've had on this bill. Thank you. Um, can I, I will say that I think our folders are very important for Wednesday. And if there's a member who's not here, who wants your physical folder because it has notes in it that you want? I think there must be a way that those can be sent to the to the members who who need them. So I'm just putting it out there. If you feel like you're not here and you want your physical folder for that bill, um, there must be a way to get it to you. I'm making that we, assumption. Did, they mail just, it to us. Just or? let me know if they, if you're one of the members who isn't here and you want it mailed. Just let me know. All right. Thanks, Erin. And, and the other, so it, when you leave here, make sure you have your folder for um, LD, uh, what is the number? 1961. Um, I'm just thinking of what I was doing that year. <laughs> um, and also the important things are the, um, you, you'll, you see them in an email, um, Aaron's analysis, the bill itself, the amendments from uh, Rachel Talbot Ross and the amendment from um, the uh, sponsors of the bill. And those will be worked, uh, they, they're, they're bullet points that were given to Aaron to turn into amendments, but you can see those sheets of paper as well. Am I, am I doing so this I, right? I don't have permission to share anything that I may have been given by legislators. Um, so I'm happy to share the bill folders and the materials in the master folder file rather, but beyond that, I don't have that authority. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. And if anyone has questions over this next week of learning about this bill, please call Erin um, and she'll help you. Right, Erin? <laughs> Always happy to help. <laughs> uh, Senator Claxton. Yes, uh, I'm more than glad to convene here and do the caucus thing, but I mean, to do the uh, quorum thing, but boy, I'd certainly like a separate room to listen in via Zoom and not via the acoustics here. I second that. We're not gonna use this room again. We won't be here on Wednesday. So we'll, we'll work out something else. I'm gonna go down and talk to them now. If we were in AFA, was that satisfactory? If the AFA acoustics were much better, what? That's right. Criminal justice is there now. Microphones. I think um, we don't have the microphone. Yeah, I think it's the microphones and and the video. I, I don't know. I'll. Yeah, uh, this is, but this is not right. We can't do this again. So we will find something else. Yeah.
Okay, so do we have a motion to adjourn? All in favor? All right, bang the gavel.